Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men, we will graduate players, and we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, 50-50 ball, I got to come down with. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. I think we're a Lincoln-Riley free zone here today <laughs> on Texax Radio. Welcome into the program. It is uh, presented to you by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, The Go Hour, presented by The Warehouse at CC Creations. I'm David Nuno. He is Olin Buchanan. Hey, OB, how are you, buddy? Uh, I'm fine. Good. I'm for happy now. you're fine. For now. Well, um, I do want to... I'm doing better than Lincoln Riley. Well, I would like to start off with some football before we get to the three things we want to see this weekend, because I don't know if you saw it. You probably didn't listen to it, but did you see that uh, Coach Colin Klein... Uh, was interviewed by Texas A&M Athletics. I, I did. I didn't listen to it. I saw he was. I, I, I know I had a requested an interview with him. We'll, we'll get it one day. We'll get it one day. I know but, it. I, uh, I trust those folks over there. And the question that caught, or the answer that caught my attention, I just want to read you the first. You know where I'm going? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, can you try uh, describe your type of offense at the end of the game? End of the game. End of the day, this game has been and always will be about the players. Truly as much, it's not my offense or it's my system. It's about learning our players, me learning and figuring out how they tick, how they think, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, how we can help develop them. That line right there speaks to me so much. Is that the line you thought I was going to go with? Um, yeah, that's all that. So um, th- there's a lot of truth in that. Mm-hmm. But you need to come up with a good system that can that can take advantage of those players and what they have to offer. And that's what I think he's saying. He's like, as opposed to, this is my offense. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to try to force you into this. And maybe slightly change, but not much. Or how about this? Here's what I'd like to do, but I don't have the quarterback to do that. So how can I get the most out of him for us to score the most amount of points? Well, that's true. Because if you got... If you don't have the personnel, there's no point in trying to do something, you know, p- to put the old, you know, square peg in the round hole. I think we've seen too much of that. Yep. Um, well, I mean, but I think he has. A, I, I know that's not what you were saying. I think he has a. I think this little, you know, Captain Obvious here. I think he has more talent to work with on his offense this season than he had at Kansas State. Sure, but if this offense would be better suited doing something different mm-hmm. at Kansas State, that's what excites me about it. Like, all right, look, this is what I, like, you talked about it a few times with Coach Fran and Reggie McNeil, like, mm-hmm. where, hey, I'm, we're going to do this offense. In reality, they ended up doing something different. Yeah. What would have suited Reggie McNeil and maybe A&M's offense overall better? Yeah, you know, have a, a, a an offense that's, well, I'm not even going to say pro style, but something that's going to feature... Reggie as a passer and or really just doing anything but the option. Yeah. Because he wasn't but the coach, that's what the coach was comfortable with. Didn't matter if the players weren't set suited for it. The coach was. So I'll give Bobby Petrino props, even though I wish it didn't go this way, but when he came in here, he had to adapt to Jimbo. Right. Right? But he did. He adapted to him. You've got to sometimes adapt to the talent you have. All right, we don't have this big physical uh, wide receiver. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. Like you don't just force things that aren't there. Absolutely. And if they aren't there, and they're you can develop it to get there. That's the secret sauce right there. All right, we I want to do this eventually. We're not there yet, but let's get uh, player X, Y, and Z to do this. Yeah, that's why uh, the the coach last year at Mississippi State was such a bonehead. Zach Arnett, your buddy. I have, I, I have all this talent. 
that has is not only suited for a certain style of offense, but has flourished it in that offense. Yep. So I'm going to do something completely different and be surprised when it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, you got to look at what you have and adjust your offense to it. But I think you have to have a a scheme that you believe in. You just don't have to, have to stay rigid in it. Right. So to me, he and by the way, Zach Arnett is uh, has just joined Ole, Ole Miss. Miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th- I look at that as a positive. Yeah. I think he was pretty good defensively. Just don't let him run your your program. Yeah, um, again, yeah. Well, you know what? He was a uh, he was a great defensive coach as an offensive coordinator, as an offensive coach. There you go. <laughs> Bottom line is, uh, it's all talk right now, right? Like, mm-hmm. but I like the talk. I like the thinking behind it. Colin Klein comes across very genuine to me. So let's go do it. I'm like I've been like I'm going to say all off season. I'm cautiously optimistic. I like Colin Klein. I watched them. Now I know it was Big Twelve defenses, but I watched the way they moved the football with guys that weren't necessarily big NFL prospects, and the way that they were explosive and all those things. So if he can do something similar here, we should be we should be very eager. We're that, always eager, but we should be we especially eager. That is Coffee Talk presented by Texas Coffee. Beat the hell out of the morning by going to texags.com slash coffee. Let's see. Colin Klein wore the jersey number seven. Bucky Richardson wore the jersey number seven. So let's have the seven. Stephen McGee. Seven. Cristiano Ronaldo, your guy. Seven. Okay. Yeah. What other seven can we think about? Oh, gosh. Joe Theismann was a seven. A.K.A. Uh, Theismann. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Hmm. There's been a lot of sevens. I'm just not thinking of them yet. Yeah. Well, caller, no, no, no. T- sorry, texter number seven. Text the word coffee. We'll get you some free Texax coffee. You can come here to pick it up. Uh, the number is 979 693 111. Pudge Rodriguez wore number seven. Did I think. he? Yeah. I think. Um, I'm trying to think. What other sevens? I think David Beckham wore seven. Dev- David Beckham. But it, that sev- seven is an iconic soccer number. I'm trying to find stuff from the other world because I want did to keep Mickey our Mantle viewers. Did Mickey wear number seven? He did wear number seven. Huh. Good number. Joe DiMaggio wore number uh, three, right? I thought Babe Ruth wore three. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Five? Ma- yeah, maybe he's five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody's going to text the, the show. Big deal upset. for the Yankees to have a single-digit number. Yeah, very big deal. Used to be, anyway. Jeter, number uh, two. two. Yeah, 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 I don't know. Billy yeah. Martin wore number one all the time. I know that. Hey, let's run our mouths. Three things we want to see this weekend. Brought to you by the Brazos Running Company, your local Aggie-owned specialty running store where you can find Brooks on Hoka Shoes, located at Century Square below the Star Cinema Grill. Ob, what do you got for us for three things you want to see? Well, of course, you know, I'm going to be covering that um, major basketball, basketball game. game. Major. So, do or die. I was just looking back at the first game against Ole Miss when a and lost. So, what I want to see is, first of all, I want to see a and Make a lot of free throws. Biggio, thank you, Philip. Go ahead. The, the, they shot 54% from the free throw line in the first game. Uh, I want to see them close out the halves, the, the half and the game strong. Remember, they had a six or seven point lead with three minutes to go and in didn't. First half. Yeah, yeah, and didn't make another field goal at the end of the game. Yep. Didn't make another field goal. And um, then um, I want to see at least, at least. Six home runs this weekend. Six. At least six. At least six. Because it seems like they're averaging two a game. I think they are. So why not two more? Keep that average Two a day. How about this? First thing I want to see, I want to see Manny Obasaki with 13 plus, okay? Mm -hmm. But a controlled Manny, but a Manny who attacks. Okay. Okay? That's the first thing I want to see. Second thing I want to see, I used to ask for 35 plus from Wade and Boots. I'm going to lower that, okay? Just a little bit. Because if Manny can give you 13, can these guys give me 30? Well, Wade Taylor gave you 30 by himself in the first game against Ole Miss. He did, but I don't think he's given you 30 in the last three games combined. So, I need Wade to, to 15-ish. Would, I'll, I'll be very happy with he and Boots 15 to 17-ish. Very happy. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's the second thing I want to see. Third thing I want to see, Ryan Prager special. Mm. Can I get 10Ks this week? I've 10K, gotten it right like, the last couple weeks. Can I get the old fun run? Get a 10K. Can I get a 10K? 10K. Can we get that? I bet you can. I hope so. It's Rhode Island. 
Why not? Are they even in a state? Rhode Island? It's, They're a road. It's a, it's a neighborhood. In an island? Yeah. <laughs> have you ever been to Rhode Island? No. Doesn't take Maybe. long to get through it. I don't know if I have, actually. I've flown into it. Rhode Island on my way to Boston. It takes like... I might have done that. It takes like half an hour to get out of Rhode Island. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Rhode Island. Hmm. A road on an island, even though it's spelled differently. All right, those are the three things I want to see. If you want to be part of the conversation this morning, call us up, Texas 979-693-1150, 979-693-1150. We go around the room to say hello. We go behind the glass, and Matthew Dawson there working the director's chair. Matthew, good morning, buddy. Oh, good morning. How are you, bud? Uh, doing all right. I'm doing all right. Uh, you know what I'm excited for this weekend? Wait, wait, your hat's backward. I haven't seen this look on you. Looking, oh, looking like a catcher. It's kind of my serious, like, hey, this is business today. This is directing. This is a big deal. So you put on a hat backwards. Put on a hat backwards. Hey, look at this. We got the, see this over here? Like, we know what's going on. So, uh, we yeah, we look like the Beastie Boys. Yeah, <laughs> but like the Leastie like? Boys. The Leastie Boys. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. But here's what I'm excited for this weekend, though, right? You got, of course, an absolute awesome slate of a sports. How about this, though? 64 conference tournament games for college basketball. You get these mid-major programs, all these seniors. Bang. Nick's, Nick's with me right there. You Bang! Get, you're telling me, like, sure, have Aggie softball today Bang! at noon on one TV, but then on the other, have Indiana State. All right, put it on. Watch uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, Abdul Kareem. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar go to work. That's have you seen Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Wait, is there a new guy? Not, not Kareem. Kareem. Oh, Kareem. At the at the break, see if it's you can cream. find the Twitter highlights of Cream Abdul Jabbar if you don't I, mind. I will. It is he's absolutely spectacular. He's basically Jokic, but like Jokic and Cream Abdul Jabbar. So he's a, is he's a white guy. He's very cream. white. Yeah, but that's yeah. why it's oh, cream. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um I remember like there used to be, oh, never mind, go on. Well, I was just gonna say, look, I'm gonna be very honest with you guys. In my old age, I don't watch the other conference games unless I'm happy about my basketball team. I'm very. It's all about what A and M is doing for me to enjoy other basketball. <laughs> you know, isn't that so so true? When I was their age, I watched everything. everything. I couldn't get enough sports, right? Yep. And now, unless it's a team that I cover or it's a game that affects the team, I'm yeah. I I just don't. But watch. when I'm happy with my team, I'm more okay with taking in content. If I'm not happy with my team, and I'm talking right now, I'm like I'm happy with the way A and M's played the last two games, but like we got serious matters ahead. You know what make me happy? And I'm winning by 50? Well, that. But how about if this happened? Because we all, we all, you always want to see, you know, the enormous upsets. Yeah. What if the biggest upset of the weekend happened today at around 11, starting around? 11. South Carolina goes down, down, down. To, to the Texas A&M women who wore out Mississippi State yesterday. Yeah. Rogers was back helping out. They, were, they won big time. Yeah. I, I would put no money on it. Unless, like, the line was like, you know. Are you aware that South Carolina hasn't lost this year? That's what I'm saying. (laughs) That's why why I would make it such an amazing upset. It'd be like the Americans beating the Russians in the 1980. Was it the Olympics? Yes, it was the Olympics. Yes. Yes. Sorry, it took me a second. Lake Placid. Yeah. Lake Lake Placid. Lake All right, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. By the way, where am I going to be tomorrow at the Angry Elephant, right? Uh, In uh, the uh, Magnolia. Magnolia. Yeah, one to three. One to three. Billy's going to be there. We're going to watch the basketball game. We're going to have fun. All right. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Who's going? Remember, I told you guys, the Dallas boards are you know, talking trash like Houston ain't going to go represent. So I'm just saying the Metroplex did show up. We'll see if uh, H-Town does the same thing. Do people still say H-Town? I don't know. You're, you're from there. You would know. H-Town. H-Town? That's what they say now. Okay. Kelly, you know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not from Houston, but I know what you're talking about. See? She's I've swag. Caitlin Dorn's from Houston. I'm I'm sure they say H Town. H Tyne. H Tyne. Obi's like whatever dude. <laughs> On the boards you'll see it written like that. Oh, okay. So go ahead, Callie. So yeah, Obi took mine, but I would be really excited to see an upset today uh, for the women against South Carolina. That'd be really exciting. Joni Taylor got her third SEC tournament win yesterday, so maybe she can grab her fourth today with a chance to knock off the reigning tournament champions as well as an undefeated team in South Carolina. So would love to see that for those girls. We have a packed weekend in Aggie Athletics. There's a home softball series, home baseball series, and men takes on Missis- men's tennis takes on Mississippi State at home, and women's tennis takes on Mississippi State on the road, which we have played four matchups against Mississippi State in the past three days in four different sports. 
So it's the week of the maroon matchups, I guess. Um, and then track and field is at the NCAA Indoor Championships in Boston, Massachusetts this weekend. And we've got quite a few Aggies who are participating in the events up there looking, home to, bring, looking to bring home some hardware for the Aggies. So best of luck to them. Absolutely. We need a good weekend, don't we, OB? Yes, we do. <laughs> like we need, a, we need two. In a, three in a row, four in a row, in good a row. weekends. Yeah, absolutely. Just a month. <laughs> I mean, a basketball. I'm talking specifically right at the moment, but yes, no, the whole year for I'm football not, or baseball. Hey, you know what? I think just, just I'm just speaking for the minute. Just get the win tomorrow, and it's another. <laughs> it's another. You know, we wouldn't say step. It's another. What would you say that a notch? Another notch on the rung. Another rung. Just on the on the ladder of climbing up you've got a lot it's a large ladder but if you just yeah. focus on each step you at a time each one at a time like a marathon ob each step I, I i suppose never ran one yeah like the great bobby brown said uh bobby brown said every little step i take you will be there never knew that song <laughs> the in see the guy that used to slap around uh whitney houston yeah he did oh yeah. Man, that's, that's, that's bad that's no, bad not a good look yeah, I don't like him. I don't like him either. But he, he I had, guess that was his prerogative. He, though. Yeah. <laughs> Bobby, my guy. Let's, let's hit a break. That's the it. only song I ever heard of Bobby Brown. That New Edition? And, and he Come was on. Mean to his wife. You, you, you listen to New Edition. Come on. That was your day. No, no, no. no? I, didn't, I don't even, didn't even see the old edition. <laughs> I knew that was coming. We'll hit a break. I'm pretty predictable. Matthew Dawson and Callie got a little game for us to play when we come back. Plus, uh, yeah, baseball, basketball, more to get into. Right now, if uh, you know someone who graduated from A&M in the last 12 years and they're leading by example in business and in service, you know where they need to go. They need to reach out to the Association of Former Students who want to invite you to nominate yourself for, or someone that you know for the 12 under 12 Young Alumni Spotlight. Nick Savage, I think I might nominate you. Each year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who graduated, yeah, bang, uh, within the last 12 years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of AM's core values of excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. Previous year honorees have included uh, leaders in business and higher education, architects, petroleum engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, and veterans of the members of the U.S. Armed Forces. 2024 nominations close on Sunday, March 31st. Be sure to submit a nomination soon. To learn more, about the recognition and submit a nomination. All you got to do is visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations. That is 12 under 12 nominations.
I'm assuming this. We're not on. Yes, Obi. I'm assuming this is Bobby Brown. Is it? Uh, I don't know, but I know that you know. But wait, wait you gotta you gotta wait for the hook though. We gotta leave the hook going. I already forget the guy's name, but he always has the right song. He always listens to us, so, so I'm assuming since we're talking about Bobby Brown, this one. Yeah, Sean's always got got it on Sean. point. But Sean or or Emily, whoever's uh, playing the music, just turn it up when it gets to this part. Every little step, buddy. Every little step. You're going to be singing it today. It's going to be in your head all day long. Nice dance. Elaine Bennis dance there. It is. It is. <laughs> Tech Sags Radio. <laughs> right, well, look. Uh, you I think the kids know what we're talking about? I, I two-step. You know, I don't. Yeah. Because you don't have to move your body. <laughs> what was this? I'm, I'm just doing the old, you know, the old guy in the car neck. Okay, neck maybe, we, maybe we should stop. Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour, presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. It's Friday, so we have a little fun. So Matthew Dawson and Callie are going to play a little game of Would You Rather. Okay. All right, but like PG version with well, like I sports would, takes. I would expect no less. Yes. So um, Probably even G-rated. Callie, I'm going to allow you to do the first one, and OB and I are going to have to figure it out. All right. Well, we'll start with the... A easy one. Would you rather crush a home run to send your team to Omaha yeah. or bury a half court shot to go to the final four? I know for me. Yeah. Half court shot. Yeah, I might be leaning that way, but you know what? I'm going I'm going home run. Because that's man strength right there. That's like pow. Or as Nick would say, bam. <laughs> Bang, sorry, not bam. But both, both will work yeah, in this I mean, equation. Yeah, both are amazing. I mean, like if you like with a homer, it's not like like they all feel good. You're gonna feel great. But if it's your strength that puts the yeah, you hit a banger like that out of the park. When was the last time you remember somebody hitting a home run to send their team to the College World Series? Mm, I don't know. Okay, how many times have you seen Christian Leitner shot? Oh the, yeah, yeah. So, but he's the only one. No, I mean, well, from half court, because everybody remembers like Tyus Edney. Yeah, that was a beautiful play. Right. So uh, that was in the first or second round. Yeah, it was pretty early. Yeah. And then they won the The national championship. championship. Charles O'Bannon and Ed O'Bannon. I guess what I'm getting at, I think people were, look, I love the College World Series. I've been twice and it's amazing. And if you have a chance to go, you should go. It's it's great. But I think in America, the uh, Final Four is a bigger deal. It is a bigger deal. But I'm just saying for me, like, imagine getting dogpiled on home uh, home plate. Like, that would just be fantastic. Sure it would. You know? Sure it would. But I'd still take the half-court thing. Yeah. Plus, I like basketball. Okay. I like basketball, too. But I like baseball. I like people. Actually, I don't. Matthew Dawson, you got the next one. All right. Well, here we go. Here we, go. we got, would you rather... Actually, I have I struggle with this all the time. Actually, would you rather watch a game alone or with friends who are not fans that do not know what they're talking about? Alone, uh, alone. Screw alone. those people. Yeah. That was perfect timing for oh, that gosh. question. Alone. Losers that don't know, like Logan yep. Lee, won't watch basketball with anybody. He shouldn't because everybody's dumber than he is when they watch uh, basketball. I, I, I hate when someone who doesn't know the sport is acting like they do. What if they're related to I, you? Not, I, I don't mind like. Irma and I went to a base, uh, Aggie baseball game one. She hadn't, shouldn't have been one. And I'm explaining it to her, what's going on, and things like that. That's fine. But when you're trying to act like you know stuff. Oh, that guy's the don't worst. Know, oh, I can't. So I just yeah, man, that's, uh, that's, that's an illegal pick. Shut up. You don't know. Uh, three seconds in the lane. Balk. Most people yell balk yeah, and have no clue what a balk is. So I, yeah, I, no. I'd rather watch it alone. Alone. But I will tell you, watching a sport, like when I watch a sport alone, I am not as vocal as I'm, if oh, I'm I, with somebody. Well, it depends on the, you know. Cowboys, you probably are very vocal. Oh, I'm vocal. cussing at the yeah. – I'm standing up. I'm like the coach, and I'm walking around, and I'm standing, and I'm cussing at the TV, and I'm calling Mike McCarthy all kinds of names. I'm making fun of his weight. I, I'm irrational. Yeah, yeah, and I don't like jokes when my team is losing, so don't be funny around me. Uh-huh. Uh, let, me be, let me be in misery, right? If my team is losing, I don't want to have a good time. I want to be ticked off. Yeah, I want to, I, yeah, by myself. Now, if I'm with some other people that understand the game, I'm really understanding, the, the, great. But you need to be rooting for the same team I'm rooting for. But I don't know if I'd want to watch baseball with Schloss. 
I'd well, like to watch other sports. No, he talk. probably wouldn't want to watch it with us. Yeah, he definitely would. Right? Like, like you guys don't here. know Jack, but like he's so smart at baseball. Like I'd be like, I knew Jack Moss. <laughs> You'd watch it with Jack. Jack Moss. He probably knows a lot about. Him. He probably knows. Hey, Kay Nagley, does Jack Moss know a lot? If if you were watching a game, Callie, you get the next one. <laughs> I was going to go back to Ovi's question earlier. I don't remember a home run that sent someone to the World Series, but A&M in 2019 had a grand slam in a regional. I remember that. Against West Virginia. Against West Virginia to go to the Supers. Who um, hit it? Bryce Blom. Oh, um, very good. I'm spell his, say his last B-O-U-N, name. That's right. Is that right? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was a grand slam, so I remember that one. Uh, okay, would you rather always lose the championship game or never make the playoffs? Always lose. Always lose the championship game. So like the Super Bowl, the like NCAA the Final, Bills, right? the Minnesota Vikings. Or what was the other one? Or never make the playoffs. Lose the championship game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, the idea is try to get there. God, that would suck if I mean, you try to never win. made the playoffs. Yeah. Like, ever? <laughs> well, I would just say this. If you were the Lions... What did you feel better about? All, you know, the decades of, of futility right. or last year getting to the end? Last the, year, all yeah. day. I mean, just coat you know, everything and you're a great coach. But would you rather Kick lose in the, the championship goal. game or the first round of the playoffs? Championship game. I want to keep I want to play yeah. as long as I, I can play. As a fan, though, that's, you, you know, the stakes keep getting higher and your emotions get worse. It's true, but... I want to win as many games as I can win. I like it. Yeah, but then you think about, like, TCU. Like, I feel like that year I would have rather lost to Michigan, like, in a heartbreaker and not and gone. Out. No, the, yeah. no, I think they have more skins on the wall because they beat. Yeah. yeah. And you can always say, hey, you know what? Play for the championship. If, you're gonna, if I'm going to get blown out, make it in the championship. To, the, to one of the best teams we've seen. You know, like, yeah. yeah. All right, Matthew, what else? Well, Real quickly, to touch on that. Like, I think you're basically asking, like, do you want to be a Bills fan or do you want to be a Jets fan? It's kind of like, yeah, Bills fan of the '90s for sure. They were, they were fun. You you always had a chance. I loved them. I loved the Bills of the '90s. I hated them. They I, were like one of my favorite teams. I wish they didn't play football in the '90s. They were really good at coming from behind. They, well, their quarterback Frank <laughs> Reich, not even Jim Kelly. Frank Reich did it a couple times in his career. Yeah. So you guys lost to the backup. You lost a huge. Lead to the backup quarterback yeah, to Frank Reich, yeah. But they didn't win the Super Bowl. That no, team, they did not. Who who they beat? Who they lose to? They lost to your team, the Dallas Cowboys. Oh yeah. Who have le- <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah. I who, was a young man. <laughs> who have less playoff wins than the Texans since their existence? All right, uh, Matthew, continue on, please. Absolutely. Would you rather be able to bench what our very own Jackson oh, geez, Moss can go. bench, or would you rather be able to run as well, fast as Kate? Oh, okay. Let's, sub seven mile. Let's, let's, well, I can do that already. I, how much is, uh, uh, not often, by the way. What does uh, Jackson bench? What does we're he say? A, we're actually probably going to have to guess this one. Oh, I would imagine they can bench like 250, like at least. Oh, then. Oh, I used to do that. <laughs> used to. I still do. So yeah. I win. Game over. Yeah, I used to work out. I don't, I don't know if I can do a sub seven right now. In fact, I'd probably be like, I don't know. What, a seven minute mile? I don't think I could do that um, right now. Gosh, at my age now, I'd prefer the seven minute mile. I uh, I think I take a different side. I think you should bench the 250. Because, sorry, getting scientific on everybody. The older you get, the more muscle you lose. You fall, you break hips. You, if you bench 250, you're not breaking stuff I'm, when you fall. I'm more, at my age, I'm more worried about the heart and how my heart is working. Yeah, well, if your heart works too hard, death. I think... Uh, <laughs> I think being able to to be in shape enough to run seven because I know a big lots of fat sloppy guys that can bench press two fifty. You talking about anybody in particular? No. Okay. Proninger. No. Oh my god. <laughs> no, no. I don't mean it. You're Bro- on one today. I, I'm, I'm drinking. God. I'm drinking my monster. Yeah, my friend. My friend Philip saw this on TV. He goes, "Tell Ob that is the worst thing you could be doing for yourself." I, I, you know. You know what? It help me do. Help me run a seven minute mile. Yeah, and then <laughs> die, in death. All right, let's try you know, to get people. You know, people will drink four or five cups of coffee in the morning. Half calf for, for the record. <laughs> Callie, let's try to get one or two. In. We got like, eh, we're already past time, so we got to hurry. Okay. Would you rather stay on a below average team for four years and, you know, do average things or join your rival and win a title? Do, do, join title. the University of Texas? Never. Average. I'd be average at AM forever. I'd win it. I'd rather win a title. 
Not me, bro. If it's Texas, for me, what? no you chance. Didn't... Barcelona, <laughs> never. You would, you you would you wouldn't go for the ring. Not at Barcelona or Texas. No. See, I'm thinking more of like. Uh, well, you said rival. Yeah, because I'm thinking like. A, Could you join the Nick Commanders? Scorton. I'm thinking of a Nick Scorton guy. Say, hey, I'm going to transfer and. That's different. Match. You have to go to the Washington Commanders. And you're, okay, you're making a good point. Thank you. There's, Even though the commanders I could do before I could do the Eagles. Okay. Either one. Yeah. No, not going to happen. All right, last one, Dawson. Let's do it. <clears throat> yes, David. Um, would you rather be known for your good taste in music or good taste in movies? Let's keep it simple. Well, I, uh, I think it shows you to be more of a, what's the word I'm looking at? Renaissance man, if you have a good taste in music. Yeah, I think music makes you cooler. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, man, this John Coltrane album was freaking great, bro. Yeah, That's how they talk, right? Yeah, not, no. Not if, not if you're listening to John Coltrane. I don't hey, think dude, so. no. <laughs> how do they talk? <laughs> uh, no, don't go there. Um, yeah, music. Music, yeah. Yeah. But. I Why are you lo- calling me names? I do love a great movie, though. Like, oh, no, sure. Do. I do, too. You know, I do, too. Yeah. But I think. I think if you want to be more cultured, it's the music. Can you go beyond the rap? Can you go beyond the country? Can you listen to polka? Can you listen to like Eastern European jams? That's to me the, a well round man. I can chicken dance my ass off. Okay. I'm going to hit a polka. break here. When we come back on Tech Sacks Radio, something different. I don't know what yet. Uh, we're talking Heritage Films right now. Chance McLean's company, yourheritagefilm.com. They make documentary films about families. They make documentary films about family businesses, family ranches, and just family stuff in general, right? You need to have Chance McLean over, be an eye in the sky for all his uh, all your big events. So if you're having a big Easter kind of event, if you are having, I don't know, um, birthday party, uh, graduation, have Chance there and video and have all the family together and get all the interviews set for an amazing amazing family moment that you'll be able to cherish for the rest of your life and your kid's life and the next generation and the next generation. You know, you can display your family ranch, family business, all these great things you can do. uh, And it's a two hour documentary. You can also do the year flicks, which is a 20 minute video Q and a form reserved for the younger kids out there. And it's more of a benchmark video. Find out what they're into in a fun kind of just quick paced video, green screen, Q and a, you'll love it. The website is yourheritagefilm.com. Yourheritagefilm.com, 
You in trouble with the office or no? No. Okay. No. But we were talking about, you know, would you rather be aficionado in music or uh, or movies? Yep. If I was a aficionado in music, I would not be recommending REO Speedwagon. Not a fan. No? No. Well, you know what I'm a fan of? What? Expanding the musical library of all of Buchanan. That's what I'm a fan of. So good job, folks, at, at Brian Broadcasting. Uh, we do, yes. Uh, who was it? Robin Dudley's draw who said, uh, is there a game tonight, LOL? Yes, we need to get into the baseball game tonight. But I, I You mean, know, I ever, the first beer I ever had in College Station was at Dudley's draw. Is that right? It's true. True story. Yeah. Um, I, I just read on the boards that Hurricane Harry's is going to close. I heard about that. Yeah, there, there, What's there, up with I mean, that? I think there was a massive... Uh, construction project going to be going on in that general area the last time you'll appreciate this i went to hurricane harry's yeah 1998 yeah sorry guys it's been a minute vanilla ice performed there I, yeah that's not what you would typically think of at hurricane harry's but vanilla ice in 1998 well was anything less than his best a felony <laughs> well played sir well played. Tech Sachs Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Nice, Go Hour, nice presented, by a, uh, presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. Uh, let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Uh, Aggies gather at the Angry Elephant. We'll be gathering there on Saturday at the Magnolia location. Callie, uh, I know there's some text messages for us. Yeah, there sure are. Durham Doc in Texas says three things he wants to see this weekend are double-doubles for Solo and Andy. That'd be awesome. 20 from Manny. Okay. And a Henry Coleman sighting. Yeah, Henry's not playing, I bet. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate. And there's been some talk that, you know, where I sit, I, I, never, I can't see the, much of the a and bench. Right. But there was some talk that he wasn't even at the game. I don't know if that's true or not. Right. That's unfortunate. It is. I mean. But if, if you can get double-doubles from Solomon and Andy, and that's not a stretch, but and that would definitely go a long way in getting a big win yeah. in Oxford. You need minimum of two wins to be in the conversation. I think another loss in the regular season, if they were to lose one of the next two games, would probably eliminate them. So either the Ole Miss game or the first round I, game. I think you need to win against Ole Miss, and you need to win your first round matchup. The first round matchup to stay in the conversation. Yep, for the NCAA. I agree. I Unless you win it all. Right. Well, right. But right. if you right. were to lose, then, then you would, yeah, right. you're not going to be winning at all. So uh, if you're going to lose one. Got to lose Ole Miss, and if that happens, you better win it all. And nobody thinks they're going to win it all if you lose to Ole Miss, right? Like, yeah. It, first of all, you got to win four games in four days. That's yeah. that's hard to do. Very hard to do. Callie, is there any more uh, on his three things he wants to see? Uh, that's all he's got there. There's, okay. yeah. What other text message you got for us? So this one's kind of funny. Jeff in Texas says every county in Texas is bigger than the state of Rhode Island, which clearly a joke but do y'all have a guess on but the actual it? i mean po maybe size wise <laughs> yeah, I, but okay. population wise yeah, I, I wouldn't know. think so do y'all have a guess on the the size like the population of rhode island as a state uh how big it is like how many people or yeah, like, like actual population size? number Not, i'm gonna say a million three okay david <laughs> not like a horse i'm sorry um i'm gonna go less than that how, how much i'm gonna say it's like the price is right. 790,000 people. Okay, OB was much closer. Well, actually not much closer. Y'all were probably about split. It's 1.096 million. Okay. So, so I lose on the price is right because I was yeah, you went over. over. Yeah, So I'm the you champion. Over. Yeah, so. Anything packed. else, Cal? And we got some some roasting of OB <laughs> a little bit in there. What, talking, what did I do? Uh, just he was commenting on um, the fact that there was little to no sports on TV when you were younger to oh, watch. Oh, see, that is just so wrong. But he said, don't ask how he knows. So he's probably well, right up you know, there with you. Well, you know, when I was in my early 20s, that's when uh, uh, the super stations came out. And you could see, like, all the Braves games, all the yeah. Cubs games. You know, so I was. I watched WGN. I watched Cubs games because it was on yeah. during the day. You know, I, I would. But I, it's I true. Watched Braves games watch Braves you couldn't watch every game. No. I'm, a, I'm old enough, I hate to say this, to remember in college football, they only showed like two games a week. Did and you, you could only, your team could only be on TV three times in a year. I know this is not new. I don't love it, though. Did you see that Fox is going to broadcast Friday night games now? Friday night games. In, in college football, college sorry. College football? Yeah. Well, it's already been done, so right. now Fox is going to get yeah. in on it. I'm not surprised. Yeah. I, 
I don't know. I, I don't like when other sports cross into other yeah. people's real estate. Yeah, I, I, I always like liked the idea that that Thursdays were for JV and freshmen, Friday was for high school varsity, Saturday was for college, and Sunday was for pros. Yeah, I Sunday don't mind a little crossover on like secondary days, right? Mm-hmm. So like, yes, football has Monday night football. I don't mind a basketball game on a Monday night. I just don't like when you invade territory that you usually don't go into. That could hurt the other sport. Yeah. I don't like that as a, as a fan. Yeah, and, and I I actually kind of like the the Tuesday game, college football game for the, you know, from the from the Rando school from the yeah, because that, that gives those guys a chance to be on TV and be the only game you know on. It's a MAC team. I just like if it's football, let's keep Friday nights for the high school kids. Yes, yeah, that's, that's why I feel about it. You know, at, at least in the in. Well, if you'd put it on TV, it's national. But like Texas, Florida, California, there's certain states that like it's it's a big deal. Yeah, and I'll I'll give them a pass for certain bowl games or sure. uh, Black Friday. You know, the day after Thanksgiving, sure. when everybody's home, so they always want to put in a game, especially early. So while the wives are shopping, the guy can watch the game. Yeah, there's nothing worse than Black Friday. But uh, yeah, for the most part, give the uh, Fridays for high schools. I agree. I agree. Chris Crobb on the YouTube page says we're NIT bound. I'm not ready to go there just yet, Chris. If you were betting, the odds would be would would be would uh, they take it? You think? I don't know. Probably. I don't think they should, but that's just my opinion. I think the NIT is good when you have a really young team and you want them to hey, get more experience. Yeah. But this isn't a young team. Yeah. So I think it'd be a. But let me ask you this. After the season they've had, would a great run through the NIT, similar to what we saw in 21, make you feel better about this season? Or no, no. there's nothing they no. can do unless they make the tournament to make you feel better about this season? No. That's interesting. I, mean, I, I agree with you. Once they play, you're, you're, all, you're, you're, you're rooting for them in yeah. each and every game. But at the end of it, hey, you were ranked 15th in the country and you won the NIT, so you're 69th. But I would be invested. I'd want them to win, as you would too, mm-hmm. right? It'd be fun, and it it, it would be. Hey, now, we I, had a great time when they when they went to uh, New York. It was fantastic. It was, it was is a great it Vegas run. this year? Where is, where is it? I think it's Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Uh, it's 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 cool, but I do think Wade probably needs a little break, right? Like it seems that way. Maybe not. Maybe maybe tomorrow we'll we'll see the Wade Taylor we saw early in SEC play. Well, I think we saw more of him. You know, in in the last we saw him in spurts, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't a sustained Wade Taylor game, in my opinion. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, we saw him breaking out of the shooting slump and yep. things like that. So, yep. All right, let's hit a break. When we come back here on Tech Sags Radio, we'll do bank on it. Plus, we're doing around Aggie Land. That and more. You're listening to Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
team. We're not on. You were saying, Ob? I, when it first came on, I thought they were playing under pressure by Queen and David Bowie. Okay, be honest. In 1988, when this song was a jam, you were at the country bar when they'd play it. You would dance. You'd cut a rug. I really didn't. <laughs> but yeah, the the team I was covering it was I want to say it was '89. Uh, the Chapel Hill Bulldogs, which were on their way to winning a state championship, beating a And M Consolidated. Okay. And, and I, whenever I'd go over to that school, that pl- song was always on. It was a jam in the 80s. It was a jam. Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. Terrence Murphy's brother was on that uh, state championship. Is that right? Team. Yeah. All right. right. T. Murph. Uh, we're going to get to Kay Nagley here in a moment. But first, let's do Bank on It presented by Vera Bank. Authentic relationship-based banking built for real life. Go see Joel Jackson and the team. Learn more at verabank.com. Ob, what can we bank on? Well, you know, I'm banking on uh, I'm banking on Wade Taylor. Okay. I think he broke out of that shooting slump, and I think uh, I, I'm banking on him having a another big game against Ole Miss. He's 17-ish the, or more? Uh, I'm thinking 20-plus. 20 20-plus. 20 yeah. All right. Here's yeah. Captain Obvious Bank on It for me. I'm banking on Braden Montgomery yeah. and Chase Lavalette. Both, both with at least two homers this weekend. Both with two. Bam, Shazam. All right. I'm, I'm here. I, is that really banking on something like that's kind of what we expect from those guys? But I'm banking on another weekend like that. Um, yeah, especially Braden Montgomery, man. He is on fire right now. He is now. on fire. He's in fuego. In fuego. <laughs> now it's time for Around Aguiland. Speaking of in fuego. Presented by Norman G. State Bank. Norman G. State Bank rock solid banking. The website is normangstatebank.com. We've got Kay Nagley. Good morning, guys. Hi. It is How was your monster this morning? I know he Effective. was looking up the Effective. ingredients. Yeah, I guess, to uh, I guess I'm going to die of liver failure. Uh, I, uh, but Tell the people during the break what I did. You looked up the ingredients to monster to see, or what was the, or it contained a secret yeah. ingredient. I'm sure was... it may have not been the exact drink he was drinking. It may have been one of the other versions mm-hmm. of it, but leads you, to liver failure. You don't know if Google's telling the truth all the time. Yeah. It probably depends on how mu- much you take, how much you ingest of this. Like an occasional monster drink is not going to kill you. No. So. No. Seven grams of sugar. Even though I'm sure there's a whole lot of people are hoping it will. <laughs> How's your blood pressure is, right now after drinking one? Yeah, is that <laughs> probably some people at this table? <laughs> you speeding up the process with monster. That's what they say. All right, let's go around Aggie. Later. All right, let's get to it. So first off, uh, Texas Aggie baseball, the number four ranked uh, Aggies, will look to continue its winning ways as they host Rhode Island for a three-game set that will be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all on SEC Network Plus. Tonight's game, 6 p.m., Saturday's game, 2 p.m., and then Sunday's game, 1 p.m., so make sure to check that out or head over to uh, Blue Bell Park and watch that. But if you aren't, go go ahead. ahead. Uh, If you aren't heading to Blue Bell Park, make sure to head to Davis Diamond as the Fighting Texas Aggies are slated for a top 25 uh, three-game set with number 22 South Carolina as they begin SEC action. Uh, All of those games will be broadcast on the SE Network Plus as well. Tonight's game, 6 p.m. Tomorrow's 4 p.m. Sunday, 1 p.m. So, Trisha Ford has the opportunity to get a big uh, three-game set this weekend. There's a lot of games between Mississippi schools and, and South, South Carolina. Carolina this yeah. Week. Uh, here's my promise. We're going to have some more so- uh, softball coverage next week. Nick and I are working on that. So, that's uh, we they, they deserve a lot more than yep. they're getting. So, if they're yep. playing great. Congratulations to their start. Another team playing South Carolina, Joni Taylor's Aggies, will look to boost their NCAA tournament resume um, they place top-ranked South Carolina. They are also the top projected top seed in the NCAA tournament. That is a big one. As uh, Joni Taylor, they were the first team out of the bracketology. As of yesterday, they did get a win um, over Mississippi State, but they hope to just keep boosting that resume. India Rogers also returned to action um, after being out six games, so that was great to have their starting point and they lost back. a bunch of those six without her. Yeah, they lost five of six without her. Uh, they definitely needed her back, and they're learning how to play without her. Aisha Koulibaly also had 17 in that win yesterday, and they will play at uh, 11 a.m., so right after the show. Uh, and then men's We're basketball. We're ending early, by the way, at uh, 1045, yep. for, for and those then, wondering. Uh, men's basketball, there's still a glimmer of postseason hope uh, in Aguiland following back-to-back wins over Georgia and Mississippi State, and A&M will head to Oxford uh, to face Ole Miss in Saturday's regular season finale at 1, pay, 1 p.m. With the winner loss, I believe A&M will... S- be playing on Thursday of the SEC tournament right. next week, yeah. but the time will vary. So hopefully they can they can pull it out. When they'll be the number seven seed. Take that. And seven teams get into the NCAA tournament potentially. I'm just saying yeah. if that's it 
It, how, how will just I, keep winning, baby. Yeah. If, if they are seven and they keep winning, okay? Uh-huh. If that's the case. And Mississippi State would be, what, eight in that scenario, probably? Mm-hmm. Eight or nine? Yeah. Probably. And they, and or they, LSU. And they get into the, to the tournament over A&M. A&M did it to themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it would look, it, I think it would be a bad look. I think if um, just win. if they beat Ole Miss today and win at least one game in Nashville, they're at least going to have to be seriously considered. I'm not saying they're going to be in or not. I've got to see what happens in all the other t- conference yep. tournaments, but at least they're definitely in the discussion if you can get two more wins. Being discussed, okay. Uh, and then lastly, track and field continues its indoor campaign um, at the NCAA Indoor Championships held this weekend at the track at New Balance in Boston. Also, another thing on women's basketball, they're in the exact same position as the men's team. If seven SEC teams get in, Texas A&M would be the seventh. So, kind of weird how both both sides of the ball are in the exact same spot. And we started off the show with the lucky number seven. Oh. See what I'm saying? All right. See the po- feeling see, the feeling. The this energy. is all set up. This is poetic. <laughs> it was just an accident. Well, hopefully, if they're if both teams get in on Selection Sunday as the seventh SEC team, we'll know. Okay, great job. Thank you. Have you heard the rumor your pops and I are going to hang out soon? I have not heard oh, this yeah. rumor. We're going to the range. Oh, really? Yeah. It's out in seven points. That sounds like something. The golf range yeah. or the gun range mm-hmm. or what, what other range? Can we go Home on the range. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to go to a range. Yeah, they got deer and Tex. antelope playing out there. What up, Steve? Text or uh, Instagram, whatever. All right. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Of course. OB, great job, buddy. Other than getting us kicked off the air, FCC violations. Other than that, you were great. <laughs> Did I say something no, I forgot? <laughs> you didn't. You were great. Thank you, sir. When we come back on Tech Sags Radio, Mark French is going to join us. After that, the baseball bunch. Got a lot of good stuff to get into with those guys. And then Billy Lucci for, I think, the last 45 minutes of the show. Potentially last hour. It's going to depend because the show ends early. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll get to your text messages and phone calls. It's Tech Sags Radio.
Texas Radio presented by David Gardner, Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's uh, talk a little basketball. Big game, elimination game, if you will, in a way, for Texas A&M to make the NCAA tournament. In my opinion, they got to win this in the in the next one to uh, to be still in that conversation. Let's go to the hotline. We're joined by Mark French, who played for Coach Buzz Williams here at Texas A&M. Mark, good morning, buddy. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good to be with you. Good to have you on the program, man. So, after a couple of wins, how are we feeling about things, Mark? Definitely. I mean, a lot better than we were, you know, a week or two ago and uh, two really strong wins to go on the, you know, the road and and beat Georgia and then come back home, especially the Mississippi State game, um, because that's a tournament team and they have a, you know, an all conference type big and Tolu Smith and some really good athletes and a a young blossoming guard and Hubbard. And so uh, to go ahead and, you know, get that win, it wasn't just getting the win, it was the way in which it happened. And I think in both instances, we saw, you know, Manny Obasaki really step up. Um, we saw Solomon Washington with a big game. Um, and I, I just think it's really cool. They're finding other ways to win, and they've also tweaked how they're playing a little bit in terms of the three ball handler looks. And um, a lot of it just has to do with Manny, be, you know, playing under control. And really, I think it's him gaining confidence. I think it was always in him, and it just required him, you know, some of that co- – that, confidence that comes when you see some success and so um I, i'm just i'm excited to see what uh tomorrow holds and then uh what goes down in nashville talking to mark french here on tech Sags radio i know that you had uh some thoughts you wanted to kind of just i don't know if improvise is the right word but you wanted to go on a little monologue to talk a little bit about the the buzz williams <laughs> tenure here at uh, texas a&m yeah so uh i was having this conversation with someone um, throughout the uh, last week. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talk on the message boards. And uh, I think Brent Zwerneman even brought it up in Buzz's press conference at one point. And I just thought it'd be a good thing to go through real quick. So y'all give me a minute or two and I'm gonna get through this, all right? So if you look across Buzz's 17 seasons as a head coach, um, I think he's only been below 500 in conference play twice. Um, and, uh, I think so much of his time at A&M has been mixed because of COVID. I think, you know, A&M really wasn't in, uh, no one was in the tournament <laughs> in the first year, right? You know, I was, I was there, the season ended in Nashville. We had, we were in the ballroom getting ready to go play. I think it was Missouri and Bjork walks in and says, Hey guys, it's, it's over. It's all over. Right. And so this whole five years, no tournament wins thing, because it rolls off the tongue real nice. It's just not true because there's only been four tournaments while Buzz was here, right? And this isn't me making excuses. It's me just being straight up. There's, a, there's only really been four tur- uh, three tournaments so far. This year will be the fourth, right? Uh, there was one very uh, bad season in there that, that year during COVID. Buzz's style does not it's not conducive for that type of environment, the way they coach, the way they build the team, et cetera. We all know this. The second year, there was a tournament. They got snubbed, went to the NIT championship game, right? Lost to the buzzer. Uh, last year, you go ahead and you do make the tournament. You get up, you know, upset or you, Penn State has a great night shooting, right? And then we have this year, right? So I think it's good to, we need to be checking people on that. It's really, well, there's really been three tournaments. This year will be the fourth. Um, and if you look at A&M's run in the 2021-22 season and the 2022-23 season, right, the two seasons prior to this one, uh, they were third in wins across the SEC to only Tennessee and Alabama, right? If you said that stat on the message boards, people would lose their minds because they don't, they don't, people can't comprehend that. And I think it's a really good barometer um, when all these people want to say, oh, we should fire buzz or we need to be looking around for 12 months from now. No, this guy, I mean, he, we've won a lot of games. And uh, anyways, I, I just think, I thought it was very important to bring that up. You know, obviously we've been in the SEC championship game, um, two out of the four uh, SEC tournaments that we've been to. You know, obviously we have one coming up this year. Um, and then, uh, you know, two coach of the year awards and an NCAA tournament appearance. So do they need to win a game in March? Sure. I completely agree. I would love to see them go on a little run, but I do think there's been a lot of winning and, um, you know, I think 
if you mark out the COVID year, there's a lot to a lot to look at there. And so I get all the frustration, but with Marble and now Coleman out, it really is. It, I mean, it, it's not surprising. It's kind of in line with you know two all conference or borderline all conference bigs being out from what you thought you were going to have you know in October. I just think there's a lot to work with there. So sorry for being long winded. That's good. I, by the way, I agree and. I don't want to say disagree. I, I'll push back a tad bit, but I agree with you. Like, look, this guy just won the coach of the year a year ago, right? He's won it twice at Texas A&M. There's a lot. The, 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 the talk about fire, that's just, that's not where we're at, folks. It's, this has been a, a very disappointing season. I agree with you that they got snubbed from the NCAA tournament a couple years back. 100%. We all saw it. But this year and that year, they did it to themselves, unfortunately. Losing streaks are what people for some reason remember. I know why they remember it. You know, I, I choose to think about hopefully the win streak that they're about to go on and the win streak that they went on in 21. And oh, by the way, Mississippi State is in the middle of a losing streak right now who lost to Texas A&M, who people love to say, well, they didn't have Tolo Smith in one of their losses. Like, well, we didn't have Boots. Sorry, we didn't have Julius. We haven't had Henry. There's And, and Wade had to carry the load for a long time. So to me, that, that argument exactly. is dumb. No, I think you're spot on, and 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 that's the thing is this whole net ranking thing is so stupid to me because it's like, all right, can A and M beat any top twenty five team on a given night? Yes. All right, like you look at the quad one wins, and I understand the quad four losses, and and believe me, I I have pointed out, and I think I've been very fair in the the Arkansas game and the Vandy and the LSU games. Those are frustrating losses because you know what it's going to do to you in the selection process. Um, but at the same time, like, man, this team, like, I wouldn't want to play them in March, right? And it, uh, you know, you look at a team like Mississippi State who, you know, yes, they're they're pretty good. And, um, you know, but why are they a lock? You know, even though they've lost some, they're, you know, they're still in and all the bracketology. And I know, understand the net ranking and all that. I just think sometimes I think we've made it too complicated on ourselves. And there needs to be some common sense in this process where it's like, yeah, man, teams go, there's ups and there's downs. And we played a lot of games without certain players, and it didn't get as much run as it does at other programs in terms of giving them an excuse for why they lost. And I, I think that's part of the fabric of this program, actually. But um, I think there's there's just no way that you put a Mississippi State team in and, and Texas A&M isn't getting in either. Well, um, but that's depending you know, the on what they do, right, at. these next couple. Like, it's still depending on that. Totally. Like they need to, they need, this is me assuming, you know, maybe we, we go beat Ole Miss and you get one or two in the tournament. Like you should be in. And, you know, you, someone else sent me uh Villanova's uh, resume. And I think they had uh, one less quad three, four loss and two less quad one wins. And yet they're like, apparently they're in, it's just uh, the transparency on it is, is really hard for me. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So that's assuming they're in, but, um, I'm hoping for the best, and, and we'll see where it lands. How about Manny Obasaki? Um, I, I keep patting my back because I've been calling for it. We're getting it. Um, look, he sometimes is erratic out there. There's places I'm like, dude, you don't need to dribble into that guy and lose the ball. Like, come on. But he does provide a different element that the other guards don't provide. And when they double up Wade and make life hard on him and they got somebody spying on, on Boots, Manny's uh, athletic ability to hit the rim is phenomenal. He brings that every time. No, man, it's, it's really is unbelievable. You see, like, shades of boots, but with someone that can, like, play above the rim just a little bit more, and maybe not as good of a shooter as boots, but as far as driving downhill, this is a guy that, you know, he gets to the rim, he can finish with anybody. And uh, I think, really, his emergence, right? So, Georgia, what do you have? He had 12 points on 410 shooting one is two from three and five rebounds four assists and then you fast forward to the mississippi state game nuno you get 17 points on six of 12 from the field two of three from three point line uh three rebounds and so um that's really been the turning point to at, you know coming out of the the losing streak was the Manny manny Obaski and how they're kind of playing three guards now so you're seeing uh the starting lineup of of, of Wade and Boots and Manny together, right? And that's something that's a credit to the coaching staff to be this malleable late in the season. But, uh, you know, I, I I think he could be the key to this whole thing. And I thought it was going to be Jace Carter, 
who he had eight points against Georgia and Jace had five against Mississippi State. Jace may be a year away from, you know, you can count on 10 to 15 points because I do think he has that sort of talent and that frame. But Manny has actually been the one that's emerged and allowed that third ball handler. So when they're doing the high pick and rolls or, or whatever, having that guy that you can swing it to and then he's attacking a broken floor that's kind of tilted and it's a little bit easier to get downhill because all the focus is on weight and boots. So it's a it's a great element, and uh, I'm really surprised at this three-point shooting as well. Talking to Mark French here on Tech Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Uh, have you heard anything about Henry Coleman? And uh, how big – I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of rebounding, a lot of ability to get to the basket. That's a, that's a big loss so far for them. Yeah, no, I haven't heard anything. Um, it's, well, the biggest thing for me would be, like, that's a guy you've been to two SEC – uh, tournament championship games with like he's been through some of these runs and he's been kind of part of the fabric of the last you know three to four years and so uh, it really it really stinks to to not have him uh, obviously on top of the whole marble situation as a played all season so it's you know it's really going to come down to solo just being an animal on the board Andy Garcia doing what he does and um, they're gonna have to piece it together Wilden's with that gonna have to rebound um, but really it'll probably come down to, you know, a lot of the guards rebounding. So you're, you know, if Manny can give you four and Wade can give you three and Boots can give you five, like that, you just kind of piecemeal it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a big loss and there's, I'm not, there's no way around that. Um, we'll see though. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with it. CBS game. Uh, I'm trying to remember the last CBS game was it Alabama last year. Um, I'm forgetting which one it was, but regardless, this is a big game, man. Like, obviously, we know it, yeah. it's. I think you called it a play-in game. It's could potentially not an elimination game, but kind of feels that way from contention, at least from the conversation. Yeah, no, it's exciting. My guy Jay Wright on the call. Love Jay Wright. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's an opportunity for A and M to go again on the national stage. Right? They've had some big wins on the on ESPN and uh, the main networks this year. Uh, this will be uh, a really important one with everyone watching to be able to, you know, get some momentum towards talking about the tournament. Um, if you were to go into Ole Miss and, and get a win there and um, the way that would lay out, um, you could do that and then you turn around and you're right back in Nashville um, with opportunities for more quad one, quad two wins. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exactly what you want coming out of, uh, what you went through. This is this is laying out real nicely. Let's talk solo because we gave Manny his props for a moment, but solo, like when he went down, I was so worried because it didn't look good, obviously. He goes out, he had to be helped off. He comes back in and I've said this yesterday, tell me if you agree, they don't win that game without him. No, there's there's no doubt about it. Uh nine rebounds, fifteen points, even more was there than what was on the stat sheet, mm -hmm. just his presence and the way he can roam and block shots, alter shots. And, but that toughness, I think this is one of the, not that he hasn't played through it, you know, injuries or, or, or what have you, but this was a, this was really cool. Cause you got to see kind of what's inside the kid and how bad he wants it. And uh, you saw his quote about, well, I get yelled at if I don't rebound. So I sure as heck was going to get that rebound. And uh, you know, I just love his personality and, uh, you, that's the type of guy you win with. He's a plus plus athlete in a plus plus athlete league, and uh, he can go against anybody on any given night. And so, if you want to go get some big wins coming up, again, starting with Ole Miss and then hopefully further, he's going to be at the center of a lot of action. And so, um, I'm I'm really proud of the kid. And how about one or two from three the other night? So uh, maybe that's something we'll we'll start seeing heading into next year. I know the answer to this because I'm not worried. But there was a stretch in the game where I got a little worried about rebounding, right? Mississippi State was getting some yeah. boards. A&M still won the rebounding battle by one. Um, so I'm not worried long-term because I think Mississippi State's just that kind of physical kind of team that that can happen. But I feel like A&M, outside of a, a, a big stretch where Mississippi State took care of business, I feel like they're back to rebounding the way we're used to seeing them rebound. Yeah, there's no doubt. So Mississippi State's one of the better rebounding teams in the conference and really in, across the country. And so they're also really big. <laughs> uh, one of my best friends is on, on staff there, and uh, I haven't talked to him since uh, a week or two ago, but uh, he was just telling me about, like, 
you know, you look at their starting lineup when Tolu's in and, and the Matthews kid and then DJ Jeffries, he's a Memphis kid. I'm super familiar with him. Uh, they're, they're really long and, uh, you know, they cause some matchup problems. So to win that rebounding battle, especially without, you know, Coleman and Marble, whatever you want to, you know, and, uh, that, that was, that was big. And so, um, I think you're starting to see A&M come up with a new formula on the fly and it revolves around obviously rebounding low turnovers. And then the, the three guard look of, uh, Wade boots, Manny. Talking to Mark French here on Tex Ags radio presented by David Gardner's jewelers. All right. So Manny could be an X factor. You'd need to have Wade, uh, do, uh tell me that. Like, cause I was going to say, you need to have you got to have three dudes that are really bringing it. Did you see signs of Wade kind of being back? I know obviously he shot better. His numbers still aren't where we're used to, but I feel like he showed me something and think that's not far off. No, I think it's not far off. And I think a lot of this, a lot of Wade's success will be tied to how well Manny and Boots are playing. Right. And so, or how well Jace Carter's playing. And so what you really need to happen is, uh, have some other guys step up and just not less the lessen the burden, but just create the opportunities that where you know maybe the pick and roll isn't trapped every time, or maybe the lane isn't as congested because they have other people to worry about. And so, I think if you really want, it's not really so much about Wade fixing himself as the team figuring out other ways um, to be feared, and and then that'll open up you know the, a little bit easier opportunities for him to cash in. And so. I, I do see signs, though. I, I like that he's continued to shoot. He's three of eight from the at three point line the other night, four of ten from the field, and the six assists against Mississippi State, and then uh, four assists, three rebounds against Georgia. He's, he's trying to do some other things, right? He's not just checked out, and that's what you want to see in your, you know, your your big time point guard. So uh, I'm, I, I think he'll shut the season down well. He's a bright lights guy. He's going to like the CBS game. He's going to like being on that stage in Nashville where he's had success. Um, he's going to like reminding people, despite Dalton Connect or all these other guys, uh, the guard at Bama. He wants to remind, you know, I'm sure he wants to remind the rest of the conference who he is. And so uh, I, I look for Wade to kind of come out strong on Saturday. Hey, uh, let's close out with this. To me, and I've said this a couple times this week, and I don't know if people have agreed with me. So you tell me you played the game at a high level. To me, their best offense is when they're attacking early in the shot clock. And it does look a bit erratic at times, but not allowing the defense to set to me is where they're best, where it allows Boots to get to the bucket. It allows Solo to get to the bucket. It allows Manny. It allows Wade. Like, to me, when they get into the half-court set is where I start to wonder, are we going to get anything out of this possession? So the nerdy basketball people call that uh, you're attacking a broken floor or you're tilting or you're attacking when the floor is tilted, right? Tilted in your favor. And really all that means is, is that when you're in the secondary break, so it's not a fast break, but it's kind of that secondary break where the defense isn't settled, but you know, you're kind of in, in the mix of some sort of offensive scheme. And then you're attacking off of that, or you're playing off of turnovers. And I think a and if you look back at the games where they've had success, there is a pace in which they've played. And uh, I don't think we want to get into, you know, I think we have the guards to do it, but I would much prefer to not get into a half court battle and uh, just continue to, you know, try to play with pace. I think that would be my word for A&M offensively. Hey man, let's have some urgency. Let's have some pace. Um, let's actually being a little erratic plays into our favor because it gets the other team off balance. It causes them to have to play our brand of physical basketball. And then, you know, the other good thing about attacking a broken floor Nuno is that it makes the offensive rebounding easier is because everyone's kind of discombobulated right. and you're able to hit the boards. So uh, yeah, man, we'll, we'll see what happens with it. Mark, I appreciate you, brother. Talk to you soon. All right, guys. Bye now. See you, man. Uh, Mark French there on the hotline. Uh, good stuff, as always. Right now, we're talking Caldwell Country Chevrolet, Highway 21 in Caldwell online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. Get rid of that ride, guys. Come on. You've been thinking about it. You've been like, man, I need a better vehicle. I got to just feel a little bit more me. I got to find that car. Okay, this is cheesy, but you know what I'm getting at. Like, when a new car does make you kind of feel good, and, and when you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet, you know you're going to get a great deal. That's one of the beauties of going there is the fact that you're going to get a good deal on the vehicle. You're going to get a great uh, trade-in value. You're going to get great customer service, and you're going to find the vehicle that you want because they're going to help you find the vehicle that fits 
your needs at the price point that you need. That's what they do there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Great place to go. Love uh, the people there. I love, that's why we bought our car there uh, a couple summers ago. It's really the place to go to buy your vehicle. Check them out. It's not a far drive either. If you're in the Brazos Valley, we're talking 15 minutes from the very edge of Bryan to the beginnings of Caldwell. Short conversation away. But you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. They are on Highway 21 in Caldwell, and you can find them online at caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. Good God Almighty, it's the baseball bunch here on Texas well, Radio. Why'd you do that? Wrestling Jim Ross. Why was not? there the intro? Was Jim Ross's intro music? No, I just uh, felt like doing it. It, it, it hit I me. Thought, By God, that's Jay Slavolet's music. Yeah, okay. I, it just felt the urge to do it. But now I feel like it feels weird that I did it. I, I, you just, we, I wasn't prepared for your an aggressive tone out of you this was morning. Was that aggressive? I thought it was kind of a nice version of Listen, it. Listen, I saw the way Olin walked upstairs. You had to deal with a lot in that first hour. Dude, I feel bad about that drink he's been like. That was a lot. That was a lot. He was a lot. Yeah. I didn't. He, I mean, He's I don't know exactly what happened. Nothing happened. But it was great. I mean, but he, he was, was walking hyper. upstairs. His shirt collar was all disheveled. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, he was having to use both handrails to get up the stairs. It just looks like you you put him through the ringer this morning. No, I I think the, it was the uh, the drink. It was definitely the drink. The drink. Yeah. Did he, he have had, some potion? He, he had an energy drink. Oh. That was f- full of a lot of energy. 
is that like a nefarious term for something else? No, I just, I, I don't agree. I think I did this to, to Richard one day when you were drinking something. I said, let me look at that, didn't oh, I? Oh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. So. so you called him out on what he well, was Well, we went through, like. I have seen Olin in that Ronnie. chair in the foyer at like 7.45 in the morning. He's got a tall boy energy drink, and he's crushing breakfast tacos. And I'm like, your lower GI is going to have a time today. What is this scenario over here? <laughs> oh, it's the Glypto Dalton. Glypto, that's right. I, I forgot about Glypto that. Glypto Dalton is back. This is the worst. What a wonder. Thank you, Nick. This is where up, Scott Clendenin is like, why am I here again? Are we talking yeah. baseball? No, we're talking Glypto Dalton. Glypto Dalton. My favorite Stone Age uh, prehistoric mammal. Stone Age and prehistoric are completely different eras. Well, l- let's talk a little Sorry, baseball. Sorry, nerd alert. <laughs> Um, Mr. Clendenin, let's start off with you. 13-0, uh, big victory over Texas, a interesting game the day after against Texas Southern. How are you feeling about things? Uh, I, I don't feel any different for how they play Texas Southern. Uh, it's baseball. Mm-hmm. It's a diamond sport. You have days like that. People forget that on April 18th, 1989, two days after Sean Byington hit home runs to beat Texas twice, uh, they struggled with first-year program Stephen F. Austin, and it was a game where a lot of backup guys started, and they had to bring the starters back in in the middle of the game. It's just what the game is. Yeah. And the, the ebbs and flow uh, for this game at any level is, can you win when you're not playing your best? Can you try to maintain some even level? And then when you hit the highs – uh, you know, can you make sure that that doesn't carry over the next game? doesn't matter what level you're at. I don't think that anybody cares that Texas Rangers and the Houston Astros struggled in September against Oakland and Kansas City when they were playing to go to the World Series and one of them won it. It's just how baseball is. Ronnie? Yeah, you've seen it happen actually with Texas. What was it, two years ago? They started 7-5 and five and went to Omaha. They started 5-7 and seven last year and went to game three of a Super, Super Regional. regional yep. I mean – the start for A&M has been super encouraging and fun. It remains that, but it's, there, it is not an indicator of what they're going to do in the postseason or even in conference play. Uh, you know, as a popular saying that's been going around the clubhouse and the locker room over there, success leaves clues. So they're having some success. So we're starting to get clues as to what kind of ball club this is, but there's still a lot of questions to be answered. And Wednesday night, I didn't, it didn't bother me one bit. That, that went over Texas Southern didn't bother me one bit. I was very interested to see how the coaching staff would handle the lineup. Would they give guys a night off after expending so much emotional in, in energy the night before and then getting back super late? It was like 1 o'clock when the bus got back into town. And I just thought, you know, with, with Gavin being banged up and Jace being banged up, yeah. that some of those guys may get a night off. But I completely understand why they played because – if you, want, if you say you want to be a professional player and you want to be a big league player, and also in nine days, well, I guess in seven days now, you're going to go on the road to Florida where you're going to have to expend a lot of energy on Friday night to win a game, and then you're going to go be right back at it on Saturday, and there's no rest for the weary. So I right. thought that was good prep for their futures as baseball players, but also their future as a ball club uh, in, in the immediate turnaround after exerting so much mental, physical, and emotional energy to win a baseball game like they did on Tuesday in Texas and to turn around and play the next day, to play those starters, because guess what happens starting next week? Good or bad, you're going out there and you're playing the next day. Yep. The point you brought up about Texas and their start, their slow starts, the 2022 A&M team is the most successful team to ever come through here. And they started their first three weekends, they were 7-4. and four. So with losses, two losses to Penn, a loss to Washington State, and a loss to Wichita State. So I'd much rather be 13-0 and 0 than 17-4, and 4, sure, but if everything's going to teach you a lesson. You can learn from it. Yeah. Scott, if the last— Good. Good. I like that. Good. Uh, the last time A&M started off 13-0 and 0 was 2015. What do you yes. remember about that team? Well, I mean, because they were, uh, you know, in, in kind of a chase for what happened in, in 1989, there was a lot of, uh, you know, hype around it. Uh, they went to Alabama with that winning streak intact. Uh, took the, uh, you know, uh, and that's where it ended. But they still had a good weekend at Alabama. I think they played that in Hoover. I don't think they, they did. Yeah. played that played at home yeah. because uh, their stadium was under reconstruction at Alabama. But uh, you just you just 
the consistency that I, I'm, I'm seeing from this team up and down the lineup is, you know, is, is what that team had as well. And Coach Schlossnagels talked about that team because he, he played them. And he said, this is, you know, I looked at those teams at A&M and that's what I want to rebuild here because of their, their ability to handle all facets of the game, their physicalness, everything like that. That's, that's not a bad model if, if this team is, is approaching that, uh, that ball club and, you know, and, and how they played the game. That, that would be a good model. And they, they didn't let winning games become something bigger than when the first pitch happened. And I think that's another thing about this team. That's why I was excited about the comeback on Wednesday is they played the game. Yep. They never said in the fifth inning, well, this just isn't our night. We hit the home run. We took the lead. Uh, I mean, uh, they, took, they hit the home run, took the lead, our first home run of the year. Well, it's not our night. They didn't. They, they continue to play their game. They overcome some mistakes, and they get the victory by something that is – uh, part of the DNA of this club is getting guys on with people up and down the lineup that can hit the home run, that can change ball games, and I think that's something that the 2015 team had as well. You know what a differentiating factor is on those nights like Wednesday? What's that? Ta- overall talent level. And because this team is so skilled and so gifted, they can struggle, and they're going to struggle in games this year, whether it be midweeks or SEC competition. They're really going to struggle. And then Jace Lavalette, Braden Montgomery, Gavin Grohovic, somebody is going to come up, Hayden shot, and hit a big homer and get you out of jail free card because they're super talented. So you can have a sluggish night physically. You can have a sluggish night mentally like we saw on Wednesday. And you can still win the game because you've got really stinking good players. And as long as those guys, and it's not just those top four. I mean, they're going to have contributors all through up and down the lineup. But if you're going to get into game-winning scenarios in midweeks or in SEC weekends, and you've got Gavin Grohovic, Jay Slavolette, Braden Montgomery, and Hayden Schott coming up to the plate, and now I'd throw Jackson Appel definitely in that mix, uh, and I would even throw Teddy Burton in that mix. If you have those six guys coming to the plate with a chance to drive runs in late in games to either stretch a lead, get you back in the game, or win a game, however – you're going to feel good about that because their overall talent and experience level is going to be greater than or equal to everybody they play. And you're talking just about the position players. I think the depth and the talent of this pitching staff is significantly better than the two we've seen in the last couple of years. Yeah, that's also going because to help. Because that right. kind of, even though it's the second midweek and it's a midweek after you go to Texas and you have this great high, you've still got talented arms like Isaac Morton in his first career start, three innings get you outs. But like last, the last couple of years, if you're playing your second midweek after an emotional victory, um, you're kind of thinking, you know, where are my where are my outs coming from? Who's going to get me the outs? And that that would have felt like a game that the last couple of years you would have dropped. Yeah, there's going to be because talent, the talent's better. They covered it up. There's going to be very talented players that don't make the SEC travel roster when you're talking mm-hmm. about, and they are going to be the ones that start taking advantage of the midweek games because they're not going to be on the road, and the coaching staff has got to get them an opportunity to play and that's why you know we've already seen that and with some guys you know coming in the lineup and and you know I, I just I, I I like how this roster is constructed and and they have that ability up and down whoever the nine are whoever the guy that's coming to the bump is and that's a great place to be right now instead of break we'll come back with some more with the baseball bunch right now Millican Reserve Time Farm to Table Community and College Station they got homes they got trails they got wide open spaces with a mission to build a healthy community around nature. And they've done that by uh, dedicating that area to creating a sanctuary for family, for nature, and to community out there. They've got respect for the native landscape. That's why you'll find 2,600 acres of open space. You've got 30 miles of trails, you've got farms, and you've got homes out there. They want to connect families to nature and to each other, and they've certainly done that uh, with those extensive network of trails throughout a wooded landscape. Beautiful place to go, throw the ball, climb trees, hang out with your family, go for great walks out there. Um, they committed to maintaining and restoring that natural habitat. And when you go there, don't be surprised. You see the white-tailed deer, the songbirds, the rabbits, and the turtles out there. And know this, when you go to there and you're a homeowner, they're going to share in a legacy of conservation, which means generation after generation, you're coming back to that same pristine countryside place. They provide a natural setting for people to connect and come together with hiking, biking, canoeing, kayaking, equestrian trails, the evening yoga, the summer camps, the music festivals, and the farmer market tours out there. It is a wonderful place to go. It's called Millican Reserve. Check out the website, millicanreserve.com. That is millicanreserve.com.
The Baseball Roundtable here on Tech Radio, presented by David Garner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, Richard Zane, Ryan Broninger, and Scott Clendon. And Scotty, one of the things you wanted to talk about was uh, about certain players not accepting the initial role that they were given. They're they're going for more. Yeah, I I I like the the you know I like you and I were sitting there in the fall when Travis Chestnut and that first hitter squad hit hit home run and maybe the next day as well. And it was like, hey, I've got guys that are coming in to take my job, but look, I'm here to compete. Um, I, I like how uh, Josh Stewart has remade himself and made him somebody that that has a you know a big role for this team. I think it's important in this day and age in college baseball with the get out of roster free card. Let's not say jail, but the get out of roster free card that you have some upperclassmen that have been through some of this that are here to compete and here to push guys. And I think it's important in the, in the, in the rocker room in the dugout and on the field that those guys have a chance to play and contribute in a big way because they weren't, they weren't ready to just be somebody on the ladder. They weren't just somebody that's going to be down below. They can carve themselves out a role. And I think that's important for any team. And there's some guys on this team that have done that, that are, that are upperclassmen and, you know, that are freshmen as well that said, hey, I'm not just going to take this as a year where I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, get a chance to play much. I'm going to go out there and try to play as often as I can. I think that's important for the squad. It, and I also think it's important to manage the dynamic of this really talented group of freshmen and redshirt freshmen because I'm going to talk about Blake Bender up as well. And them understanding that when they get a chance to go in the batter's box that they don't have to get a hit right there like that at bat does not determine their future. It's really hard for a young kid to mentally process that, though. Yeah. If you're Jack Bell, if you're Jet Johnson, if you're Blake Benderup, who started the season as the starter at first base, and you see your results dwindle and thus your opportunity dwindle, when I go and get a chance to step in the box, you have this feeling of, I have to get it done right here. And I think the coaching staff is going to have to battle some of that because you, A, you have to get those guys. It, get their feet in the batter's box as much as you can and on the dirt as much as you can because it's good for the future of this club and the future of the program. But secondly, you got to do it because what happens if Jace Lavalette gets hit on, hit on that spot on his elbow again? Right. Somebody's got to go play center field, whether yeah. it's Travis Chestnut or Caden Sorrell. Uh, you know, what, what happens if Braden Montgomery's scheduled to pitch on a day and he goes out there and he doesn't have his best stuff and you got to get him out of the game to make roster moves? Like, you have to have those guys ready – to compete at a high level and then understand that it's about this at bat, nothing in the future. Whatever I do here is be really in the moment. And I know they do a fantastic job of that. I know how much mental training goes on, but it's human nature, right? For me to sit on the bench for three or four games and then my, my number gets called, whether it's in a pinch hit role or a starter role, and I want to go up there and I want to hit the ball 600 feet. I'm going to prove this to people and I need to, I need to get a hit here so I can – Keep getting these chances. It's hard to manage that, but it's important that those guys get those chances. I think a guy in the lineup that you've seen really take a role is Hank Bart. And his he got that pinch hit opportunity late against Wagner, hit that grand slam, and then he's getting a start the next day. He's been I think the catcher position's been really awesome. Behind Appel, you've got Coffer and Bard. One thing to your point though, how old is Hank? Hank's is, yeah, exactly. He's senior. So he yeah. he doesn't feel like when he goes in there, he kinda understands the ebbs and flows of yeah. a season. It's different because he's been around a while, so he kind of knows how to handle mentally the ins and outs of, of being in the in the lineup one day and not the next. Chestnut's the same way. That hey, my role right now is I'm gonna I'm gonna be this defensive guy, be a pinch run guy. But you're exactly right, and and he somebody that saw last year that hey maybe my role will expand if there is a guy with through ineffectiveness or injury that I'm gonna get a couple days in mm -hmm. a row to play, and and older guys their heart beats better. They're not gripping that bad as tight as some of the younger guys are. But I also think this team, they can convey that down. And, and It'll be that, important for them to do that. It'll yeah. be import it's important for Stewart to say, hey, th the coaching staff helped me get better in this offseason and after the fall, and look where I am. Oshenbeck, hey, look what I did when I got my opportunity, you know, there is a guy there that can go to other players and say, when you get your chance, you want to do your best, but don't put the weight of, your, of the world on your shoulders if you don't.
And I think this team has a great dynamic with that. Hank Bard is, is a prime example. I think Stewart's a great example of the pitching staff because he's completely reinvented. He's on his second school. He's on another pitching coach, his third pitching coach, I imagine, in his college career. And the, we, Max Wiener comes in and says, let's reinvent yourself. Brad Rudis, another guy who's reinvented himself. And they're battling for spots. They're trusted guys out of the bullpen now. You're talking about dudes who are okay with their roles but still battling for more. Chris Cortez was okay with no longer being the 99, 100-mile-an-hour fastball guy. Now he throws a sinker that's a tick down on the radar gun. And he's still battling for another – he wants to get in the weekend rotation, I'm sure. Shane Sadeo earns an opening weekend start, and then now he's in the bullpen. And he's okay with it because – the staff to trust him, and he knows he can get dudes out, and he's a huge important factor. Well, on the reason team. why it's so important is because on Wednesday night, you get out there to the ballpark, and Isaac Morton goes to the mound, and he's firing 96, 97 mile an hour BBs, and you're going, "Holy crap!" Mm-hmm. Like this kid looks like a front line SEC starter at some point. He's not ready now, right? But for the coaching staff to have the dynamic where work while you wait, work while you're not ready now, just keep working. Your time's going to come, and then Isaac goes out there and has some good results, and he starts saying, okay, yeah, th- I can do this. I can do this at this level, whether it's Texas Southern or Texas or Texas Tech or LSU. I can do this. I can get guys out. And the more belief that that freshman class has on the mound and at the plate that, that they belong here and they're going to be, be it, difference makers and impact players at this program, the better that it is. But they're still going to fight that one. Hey, it's my chance. Here's my opportunity. I have to go do it right now. You're seeing that kind of wear off of Gavin Grahovic because guess what? Gavin's starting to know, hey, I'm, I'm going to be in the lineup. I'm in. Yeah, yeah I, I'm good. I don't have to prove myself It's the same approach anymore. they did with Jace last year. Right, exactly. All right, uh, Richard, let's, uh, let's talk Ryan Prager. We were talking about him at the break. I'm going to read this to you because I know you know the, the number, but just for the audience. Uh, he is one of nine players that have yet to allow a run this season, <laughs> has three wins, ranks uh, fourth nas- uh, nationally. The redshirt freshman or so- sophomore has also struck out 27 batters, which is fourth most in the SEC. More impressive than that, I think it's 27 strikeouts to four walks. Right. Right, he's getting guys out and limiting the free passes, and I think that's really been the key to success for him and to the pitching staff as a whole. And he's you know, every opportunity he's gone out there, he's taken the chance to establish himself as a true frontline starter in the SEC. And you know, he's two weeks away from truly getting to prove that when they go to Florida. Yeah, I think one of the biggest indicators for future success for Ryan, obviously, is coming back off the injury. What was the stuff going to look like? because you have to have real stuff in this league to get guys out. But secondly, I think it's been really cool to watch his approach to the game mentally. And he's just even killed, mm-hmm. not, doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. And he's, he knows he's going to face adversity. He's an extremely intelligent kid, very like measured in what he says. And you can tell like Max Wiener has, has had a big influence on, on him as a human being yep. and also as a pitcher. So – I'm encouraged by by Prager's start because of the stuff has returned and then where he's at in, in his headspace. And he may get beat around a time or two, but I don't think that's going to change who he is as a pitcher. I think it was important, and it showed what kind of teammate he was when he flew out to the regional at Stanford last year. When he went on his own dime, when the NCAA said, here's your travel roster, and it was important for him to go out there and still be around that, to still be around that atmosphere. He had sat in that dugout all year long, working on his body, ready to get healthy for this, and then in the fall, not a guy that's going to get time, and it was just the sto- slow and steady progression. He's bought into what the plan was to get him back. He took care of his business. He stayed connected to his teammates at a high, high level. And you get the benefit of this. The game pays you back. How often do you hear the game pays you back? He has taken no shortcuts. He has done nothing but be a great teammate. And in a league where Friday night starters in the SEC turn into first-round draft picks, he looks exactly like that. And I think that that is the game paying somebody back that went about his business the right way on a season where he wasn't going to get to play. The game of baseball doesn't care or know what jersey you wear but it does care and know how you treat it. And that is a lifelong truth in every experience I've had with this game. Baseball sucks at times. It stinks. Like, you can do everything right, and the game will still humble you. And once you figure out and and you humble yourself, like the the line from Bull Durham, from Crash Davis to Nuke Lelouch, you got to play this game with fear and arrogance. It's 100% Mm -hmm. true. Baseball will humble you more so than any other sport. I've heard golf is very similar in that way. 
But golf, you're competing with yourself. When you step in the batter's box, there's all eyes on you, and it's you against that guy out there. So there's some manhood about the game of baseball, a mano y mano kind of feeling. And it doesn't care if you're wearing a Texas Southern jersey or a Florida jersey. All it cares about is how you treat it, the work you put in when nobody's watching, how you treat your teammates, how you treat your coaches. All of that stuff, I think, goes way more into success than the jersey that you're wearing. You got to go, right? Got to go. Got to go uh, uh, where to uh, see uh, the funeral for Ben White, former College Station mayor, big Aggie fan, season ticket holder in every sport that A&M has. I know his, his family is uh, grateful for the community and everything he's done. He was a, a really good friend of mine, and uh, I'll miss him, but I'll be listening to you all finish up the show today. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, appreciate Scott. it, sir. Yeah. All right, we'll hit a break. We'll come back with one last segment of the Baseball Bunch here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. All right, we're back on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Baseball bunch here for, we got three minutes, guys, so not that much time. Let me ask you both this, your, your perspective. Yeah, I can't wait for Billy to come in. I, I really enjoy listening to Billy's baseball takes. When I think of great baseball minds in the modern era, you know, the guy that short hops the head coach is the front of my mind. 
It was an O2 pitch. It generated a chase. Don't right? don't buy into his narrative. Like, and by the way, as Billy does with his stories, the narrative or the the his portrayal of what happened in the bullpen for warmups is a little embellished. A little bit. He nearly took down a five thousand dollar piece of equipment on a ball that he threw that hit the back of the batting cage on the fly. So it hit one of the metal walls on the fly. And in doing so, almost took out a very expensive piece of equipment. That piece of equipment was on the plate next to me and about, it stands at about six feet high. Right. But he's going to come. We all get better whenever we tell the truth. That's my only thing. Okay. Just be accountable for it. Yeah. I I had to dial it in. I was a little erratic and, and Bronny helped me dial it in. He had the ball kept coming out of his ring and pinky fingers. So it was coming out the side of his hand, and I was trying to get him behind the ball. This was two weeks ago. Right, but I just I can't. I mean, okay. it's got to be addressed. Fair. Addressed Does it have it. to be addressed? It was. It, it was, was addressed. addressed. <laughs> All right. I don't know if we have time to answer, uh, ask this question, but I'll, I'll see if you guys can rapid fire this. When do you think we can actually know who this A&M team is? We have a f- great feeling right now. They're 13-0. Does it take a few conference series? Does it yeah. take yes. middle of conference play? Uh, like, when do you think we can know? I think I need three weekends in conference play. Is that Auburn? Is it? No. Florida. The second week. Florida, Mississippi State, and Auburn? Sure. I don't know. Third weekend, though, I think is a – Nick just had the schedule, but they're doing – it sounds like they're roughhousing back there. Whatever the third weekend is, I feel like that's when we'll have a really good idea of – these guys start to settle into some roles, and uh, we have a, a much bigger sample size by that point. But right now, I mean, again, to to critique this team is nitpicking. Yep. I mean, yep. you cannot yep. argue with a 13-0 start. Yep. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Get to the ballpark early. The Big Jen singing the national anthem. Oh, is that right? The Big Jen. Who's the Big Jen? It's his girlfriend. Oh, your job. All right. Good stuff. When we come back on Tex Hex Radio, Billy Lucci will be in here, and I'm sure he'll have a response for Ryan Broniger and much, much more. That's Tex Hex Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
All right, everybody. Welcome in. Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Got a few minutes to get some texts in if you want to. 979-693-1150. If you want to voice your opinion on Aggie Hoops, Aggie Baseball, or maybe even some of the stuff you heard from Colin Klein there from that uh, Q&A he had with Texas A&M. If you haven't seen it, uh, check out their Twitter handle. It's got the, uh, the link right there. Um, it is Tech Sags Radio, as I just mentioned. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Callie Gardner's there. Callie, uh, let's do it around the SEC, shall we? We shall. Let's do it. On three released their SEC baseball power rankings entering the final weekend before conference play. And again, taking everything with a grain of salt, considering the level of competition is about to increase severely. But one week out from conference play, they have Arkansas at one, LSU at two, A&M at three, and Florida at four, followed by Tennessee, Vanderbilt, then Alabama, South Carolina, Auburn, Kentucky, Georgia, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, and Missouri at 14. Uh, I have a question for you, David. If yes, you could pre- predict A&M's toughest con- conference series, who would it be and why? I would have probably initially told you Florida, and that's coming up early. Uh, and it still may be Florida. But um, put up the schedule for me. I'm trying to see where, where they're at for a couple of these. But Florida, I know you're on the road at Florida. That one, to me, initially is the scary one. Obviously, you're going to LSU. Um, that's a, the scary one. I would say between those two, Florida has lost a couple games, but they're still very talented. I think they're going to figure things out. LSU's having a great start to their season. So I'm, I, I'll say between those two, but because Florida's so early, um, let's just go with Florida for right now. I like that answer. I think, I think that should be an exciting series uh, coming up. Next By the way, you weekend. do host Arkansas, which is good. So it's not all on the road. So yeah, that Arkansas was going to be my answer. Just looking at the the schedule, the two game or the two series before you have LSU on the road and then Ole Miss on the road. I know Ole Miss is not the team they were two years ago, but uh, just following two weekends on the road and then you have the pitching stuff that Arkansas has. I think that's going to be a tough one. And I was talking to a couple of my friends and we were saying that honestly might be the series that decides the SEC West champion um, based on how the two teams are playing right now. So could be exciting having that one at Bluebell Park yep. to end the regular season. Uh, football, Antonio Coleman flips his commitment from Auburn to Alabama. He's a four-star. He was the highest ranked recruit in Auburn's 25 class. He's 6'2 and 280 pounds. So he will be uh, rocking the Crimson Tide. Uh, wide receiver C.J. Wiley announced his top 10 in that included Alabama, Auburn, UGA, Ole Miss, LSU, and A&M. They were all in his top 10, so it should be exciting to see where he lands. Uh, offensive tackle David Sanders announces his top six with four SEC teams that are in the mix. That has Bama, UGA, South Carolina, Tennessee, and then Clemson and Ohio State are also on that list. Um, in SEC women's basketball, we've got uh, the tournament that's continuing. Florida has had a big couple of wins over the past two days. They got um, a win on what is Wednesday and then a big win last night over Vanderbilt. Um, they are cruising right through it. So they play Ole Miss today after, at the very end of the day. Um, and a and faces off against South Carolina, so that should be exciting. The Tennessee-Alabama game in that tournament should be a good one. We're excited to see um, who who takes the win there. And then Auburn faces off against LSU tonight at 5 o'clock uh, Central Time. So uh, women's tournament has shaped out to have some pretty good games, and we're excited to see um, – who takes home the who, who takes on the crown? Hopefully, hopefully the Aggies can get it done this year. So, as a reminder, this show will end a little early. We're going to end at ten forty four ish for to set up for that uh, pregame show for A and M South Carolina there in the second round of the uh, SEC tournament. Let's go shock the world, get uh, South Carolina their first loss, ensure that you get into this NCAA tournament. All right, if uh, Billy's not here yet, so if you want to be a part of the conversation, you can do it. You can call or you can text. He might be showing up because I see Bronny smiling. Oh, he is showing up. And, uh, you know, he's going to have a hot sports take. But regardless, you can send Billy some questions at 979-693-1150. And shaking your head, what happened? Nothing happened. Okay. I was driving over here listening to you and Olin from hour number one. That was a fun hour. Um, I kept getting interrupted when I was trying to. And I almost just kept driving. 
You're like, I'm, I'm not. I was like, I'm not taking part in this these shenanigans. Which shenanigans in particular? And I almost just kept going right. I I, I looked ahead and I was like, I'll just keep going down Wellborn into Bryan. I, hell, I thought about going left to Austin. That's how bad. Yeah. I, it's where my. It's interesting. Like, Our numbers geez. spiked during that hour. People <laughs> yeah. were really happy. And then I was show. like, then I was like, well, I could just go up to like Waco and cover Baylor. I know some folks up there. I'm like, I, I just didn't know which way to go at that what, point. What, what in particular caught your attention? Maybe halfway to Austin, I would have stopped and and gone and visited, you know, Carrie and company over there at Snows, even though they're not open today in Lexington, and just kind of regrouped, started thinking about Jordan Peterson coaching the A&M secondary and remembered why I do this because whew, there was a few minutes there where I was like, was it what the, am I uh, driving Would into? you rather segment? I didn't even get I even got to that. Was it uh, Lincoln Riley reference in the top of the I show? I did not even <laughs> was hear it, that. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, just, what, what, I don't even know. Keep going because this might be it for the, oh, uh, <laughs> for the show today. Uh, Colin Klein. We talked Colin Klein. There was nothing wrong oh, with that. Oh, it was funny hearing Olin cry to open the show about him not getting the Colin Klein interview yet. That was a good <laughs> on-air complaint. <laughs> yeah. The head coach was in here for like an hour. I'm looking at ago. the rundown. I remember we did three things we want to see. I don't remember anything wrong with that. Um, You called somebody in the back, one of the Leasty boys. That was good. That was well. That was like a – I could see Billy using mm. that line. Olin had a off-color comment. Oh, he did. Out of the, that, I mean, that it was, was an interesting one. It was a rough. It wasn't even. I'm not even an hour in. It was a rough oh, 30 minutes. It gets let's worse. Say that. It gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> it gets Thank you, Richard. That, that, in fact, I, I was surprised it was the first segment that caught your attention because trust me, it got worse. <laughs> oh no! And whatever you do, I wouldn't listen to the baseball bunch. That's all I'm saying. Oh my god! So it's my fault do? today. What they do today? Nothing. Just you know, it was just, I I just wouldn't listen to it. That's all I'm going to say. Please tell me they left me out of it because I've already used up my allotted time to talk about random things. I don't want to have to go in on. Yeah, because we don't have a lot of time today. Yeah, I don't want to have to go in on those two yahoos. No, no. Let's okay. uh, let, let's move on. Can I, I don't want to have to go in on the brother's ass hat. <laughs> Can we get your take uh, on the Colin Klein stuff? Um, what? What stuff? Well, I just thought it was a very well done Q and A. I got to. We haven't really. Oh, heard that from, little thing that Aggie football put. Yeah, out. yeah, I yeah. like that. That was good. Mm -hmm. and, and the the thing that caught my attention. I was like, "What happened? Did something?" No, happen nothing bad happened. No, I'm just the part that I liked was his. One of the questions was asked, "What's going to be the offense?" And he went on to say, "I'm going to tailor it to our talent." And I like, I just like hearing that because you have to sometimes. Yes, you have a vision of what you want it to look like, and mm -hmm. you. But if you don't have the personnel to run it, or the person that you have actually can run something a little bit better, then you, you morph into that. Of course, I mean, I think Colin Klein is a really good young coordinator. I think he was – I told you guys this before. And, oh, there he is. <laughs> He's, I, That's all in my My way. eyes are watering for some reason. Um, so, I think uh, – Colin, I told you this before, like, almost everywhere – like every coach that was getting kind of vetted mm -hmm. and part of the process, like, well, what are your thoughts, you know, on, on your coordinator hires? Who are some guys, you know, are, are you bringing someone, would you bring someone specific? What are your two of the names that came out very consistently were almost, almost with every defensive coach that didn't, you know, that wasn't calling their offense that they talked to. The names that kept coming out were Stein at Oregon and Klein at Kansas State. Mm -hmm. Coaches around the country, coaches that they were considering for this job, kept mentioning those two. Mike Elko, pretty much, I mean, for he did. It was narrowed down to Colin Klein and, and Den Brock, who was at LSU, who led that. You know, Jaden Daniels won a Heisman. You have Malik Neighbors, the receiver. You know, the other receiver, uh, he's at Notre Dame now. He was kind of looking to leave. LSU fans haven't – I don't. I mean, we do this too. Everybody does this. You, well, he, he was going back home. He was going – and you convince yourself of that, but he was trying to leave. And I don't know why. I guess maybe – I think it had to do more with they had two young – and this is, this is just factually. I think they had two younger guys – that were thought to be up and comers in the offense. And I think mm -hmm. they were going to start to get more uh, responsibility, more input in the offense. And I think he saw that coming and got out. 
I think he'd probably been with Brian Kelly for a while and thought that shouldn't happen. So he was looking to go. Um, and Elko chose Klein. Right. After the first time he met with him, that's the guy. And you go look at their offense at Kansas State, what they did in route to winning the Big 12 a year ago, uh, which, by the way, I know it's Kansas State, and, and we as Aggie fans think of the good Kansas State, and we think of, we think of uh, you know, Bill Snyder Bill and days. Michael Bishop, yep. and then you think of like L. Roberson and Darren Sproles. Um, you can think of Kansas State when Colin Klein played there. Right. But for them to go and win the Big 12 and win that conference – and beat a, a TCU team that was on its way uh, to the college football playoff and got in after losing to K-State. And by the way, that was a high-scoring offensive game there where Kansas State lit up that TCU defense. That is still a major upset and accomplishment for that program to win that Big 12 with TCU where they were, with Oklahoma, mm -hmm. with Texas, with Oak State. So, and, and then I watched K-State this year, too, when they weren't quite as good. And you watch their offense, and, and, and I always laugh because Texas fans, when A&M hired Klein, showed those four plays in overtime where they couldn't punch it in. I'm watching those four plays, and I'm like, that's a touchdown if he sees that gaping hole there, the right. quarterback. That's a touchdown if they block Devondre Sweat to get his hands down. It's a play that's drawn up with a wide-open receiver. Third down, there's a touchdown. It, it, I, actually, you watch it, and you go, no, actually, these are terrific play calls terrific design um but watching the forget about that one series watching them the last couple of years what they do in the running game you know the year before they were elite on the ground uh what they do with some qb running game when they whether they have to do a lot of it or a little of it and then what they do attacking the football field in the passing game and that to me is what was a little more different than the k-state I was maybe used to prior to that uh, for in recent K state is the way they attacked down the field. And there's a reason Kansas state fans were so devastated when he left. He's one of the really sharp, bright young minds in this game. And I think Elko and this staff have already started to see that. And uh, I'm fired up about, you know, what he can do with Connor Wigman with, Guys like Moss and Owens with maybe a healthy Donovan Green and a lot of bodies at tight end and then with, with some, I think, what could be high-end receivers. I'm not going to go all in on the Ag skill position yet. guys just yet yep. because Ruben hadn't played a lot of football. Like You, you can be a five-star – but when you're going into your second year in college, you're no longer a five star. So Ruben Owens has a ton of talent. Now we got to see it put in action on the field. I think he's in the right offense now to do that. Um, I think Le'Veon Moss has an incredible amount of talent. He just decides, like, hey, I'm going to lock in. And by the way, I know everybody reads a lot into his tweets and stuff, and you never know what happens with players. He's been out there working and practicing. The day, the day after he posted that, he was out there yeah. during team workouts, full of participants. So sometimes maybe, and including us on this show, when, when these people start badgering you guys, and like you and Olin, maybe tap pause for like the afternoon to figure out if there's anything to it. Sure. Because we get, I saw that tweet and I was like, oh, here we go again. Here's another player complaining, you know, like, and then they're out there practicing. So sometimes this is too much. Maybe there's something down the road where you go, yeah, that was a kind of a warning sign. So we just don't know. But I know, point being, if he's in good standing, he's great. I think they got he's a couple really of great options. And EJ Smith's now in the mix, who's a veteran that kind of can do a little of everything. And then at receiver, you know, we've seen what Moose can do at his best. Jade Walker, the way he ended the season mm -hmm. was really impressive. And we've seen flashes of it from Noah Thomas when he can stay healthy. And I'm bullish on Chase Allen from Louisiana Tech. And I'm also pretty damn excited about Isaiah Williams. He's, he's, making, he's, he's making a really strong first impression. But with that said, like, 
you go back to how you felt about them last year when you had a fairly proven, you know, having just one year, Evan Stewart. You had an all-conference candidate in Anaya Smith. Um, you go back to some of those receiving cores prior to that under, like, Sumlin, even Mike Sherman with the Fuller and Swope leading the way and easy. Like, this group still has quite a bit to prove. But what I think, and you talked about yesterday, I think, they're, I think they have a chance to be really good at receiver. But Colin Klein, I think, is going to look at it and say, where's our strength? Is it in the backfield? Is it our run blocking? Do we have tight ends that can block or not? If we don't, then we have to figure out something else to do. You know, can these guys be weapons in the passing game to help out the receivers? Do the receivers not need help? Are they the strength of our offense getting vertically? Maybe they can free Moose up and he starts, you know, feeling it like he's done in games past, but for a stretch of games. I don't know the answer to it. I do think at the end of the day, though, he's going to kind of come back to one thing, and it's going to be number 15. Mm -hmm. And I think Connor Wigman is a guy that Colin Klein is going to realize he can build a lot around, and I think Wigman's going to be one of those guys that the way he plays is going to make an O-line, it's going to make a running game, and it's going to make wide receivers look a lot better because he's going to give those receivers chances to do what they do. And in the case of Moose and Noah, it's certainly go up, get the football, make contested catches, make plays. I think by scrambling, he's going to make receivers look better. I think what he can do in the QB run game is going to make the running game look better. So I think at the end of the day, Colin Klein's going to look at everything and he's going to go, I've got some nice pieces here, but I've got a piece that can really take us to the next level under center at quarterback. Yep, let's hit a break when we come back, a little basketball talk. Uh, Costa Vida guys, uh, they obviously you can get uh, during the season, you can get their food there at, at Reed Arena. You can still get it at Olsen Field right there on the third base line, and they've got a great menu that it in consists of chili lime chicken they got sweet pork burritos they got chili lime chicken sweet pork baja bowls yes sir oh mm -hmm. sorry um chips sweet, queso chili lime chicken twice it makes me think you maybe want to go get some today well i'm just reading what it has on here yeah they, they got a tw two different ways you can have it right uh, uh, in uh, the bowl yeah key lime pie and for cooler weather nights so not today but tomorrow and sunday you're going to have a uh, Mexican hot chocolate. I think Brody might get himself a little bit there. And obviously in store they have the... Well, uh, he would have to stop talking for a second to, to get that. Well, Holly's invited him to come. I don't know if come. he has time to do that. <laughs> she's, um, she's invited him to come by. By the way, they have an amazing, an amazing tres leches. Tres leches. Tres leches at Costa Vida. Costa Vida, yeah. I believe, Holly can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe they make it from scratch in-house daily. If you order it, they give you a gigantic piece of tres leches. But you, that wasn't, that was I didn't roll the R, yeah. I rolled the tres C-A. Leches. <laughs> tres leches. They do it. You don't roll the R before the T, it's <laughs> after. No. Tres leches. And it's not two R's, it's, it's just they do, tres. They do it. Great job with it. I'm just telling you, I'm I'm a fan of that cake. I have not been a fan of that dessert for years and years and years. And now, recently, in the last couple of years, I've started to go. Okay, it's not that bad as long as it's not soaking wet. And uh, this one's the perfect amount of moist and very. It's good. <laughs> It's good. Holly's texting me. Yes, Billy, it's from scratch. Yeah, so it's there from you scratch go. daily. And they, I'm telling you, and they don't skimp on the serving either. Yeah. Uh, go check it out. Ob obviously, when you go out there to South College Station, check out the uh, home run combo favorite option of Jay's Lavalette and number 12, Ryan Targaj. It's an entree with uh, sweet pork enchilada smothered in house-made queso with rice and beans and a large drink, all for eleven ninety nine. Go find them there, 4501 Mills Park Circle in South College Station. It's Costa Vida. Check it out.
Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. I'll go. You come hang out with the alligators, with me and Swopey. Buddy, oh, I mean, do, do we bring a weapon Lance to protect and us? Adam over there. I, I believe you'd probably have a weapon. Yep. Maybe not, though, on this boat. You're out there just to fish, so. Yeah, but you, you got to come packed. And when you're walking around and you hear something go, and you see all the stuff moving uh-huh. and you realize that you were a few feet away from one. Small boat, big boat. A uh, little boat. Little boat. Very small Th- boat. That uh, alligator, if it hits it, you can knock, get knocked over. Yeah, it'd probably have to be a pretty big one. Yeah. I think but I'll... they could probably get into the boat. Had they okay. So chose. <laughs> I'm out. And they're not, they're not really according. And we can ask Swopey about this because he was out there yesterday. I don't think they're, they've kind of had much human interaction out where they're at. So they're a little more curious, let's huh. say, than the norm. The gators normally would be smarter if they've been around enough people and they just kind of, they give you your space. They don't want to. You know, they've seen the ending, some of their friends. Yeah. But these ones have not. So. I'm, I'm a fan of life, not death. So I'm going to pass on that. I would, I, look, I think it'd be a hell of a story if you just had, a, you know, one take, a, just your, like pinky? tip of your pinky. No, I like my pinky. It's tip, a good pinky. Just the tip. No, how about you, just the tip of yours? You can't copy me, David. I already came up with a story here. Well, I had a different story. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's talk a little Aggie basketball. We're going to okay. be at the Angry Elephant tomorrow for yeah. that game, one to three o'clock. Magnolia. Who's going to be there? I've been telling the people Dallas represented. We'll mm-hmm. see if Houston represents. Hopefully, they do. Yeah, yeah. North Houston must win. We know the deal. Yes, are there other scenarios if they win the SEC tournament? But for the way this team has played, they, they want to be in the conversation, Billy. They got to get this one. They got to get this one and, and one or two more. I think uh, if I'm just I'm I'm still I can't get over where they would be at right now had they just beat South Carolina last week. Mm-hmm. Just that of all the, all the things, Vandy, LSU at home, Arkansas both times, buzzer beater to Ole Miss. They could have knocked off U of H. They were in position to do that without Boots Radford. Yep. All of those things, they just got to stop against South Carolina, and it wasn't even close. It was just down the court layup, and I don't want to hear about the the clock thing before the end. But you should have got that. You had the, the lead with a chance for the defensive stop. They they were in position to win. They were also in position to beat this Ole Miss team at home. They they weathered like a twenty to zero something in that neighborhood run to bridge both halves. They came back, took what. Really, I felt like was it wasn't. I wouldn't call six or seven points a commanding lead with around four minutes left. But it's a it's. Ole Miss had a mountain to climb, and yeah. and the Aggies by not scoring another field goal in the final, three forty five or whatever allowed them to climb that mountain. They didn't hit another shot, uh, the rest of the way just some free throws. So, as it stands now, the Aggies have to win. They have to win today. I don't think there's a path to them to get into the tournament without winning today, finishing 8-10 and 10 in the league. Uh, with, you know, people say, oh, Arkansas went last year at 8-10. and 10. Okay, I'll be honest. I haven't studied Arkansas's 8-10, and 10, but for a team that went to the Elite Eight last year, like, I don't think their 8-10 and 10 probably included as many Bad losses yeah. as A and M did when when you go down to Vandy, Arkansas twice. Arkansas twice, who you know who's struggling mightily right now, and they've gotten to be where they're respectable now. But Arkansas twice, Vandy once, um, and I don't know where that Memphis, you know, that Memphis loss has gotten a lot worse as the season. They're eleven and six in conference, so not that bad. Who, um, Memphis? Yeah. Yeah, it went Tw- downhill pretty eight. quick. They lost a bunch of games. So maybe that's not as a uh, quad. It, it had won- fallen to a quad three at one point. They've won four straight, so they're, they're a yep. little bit on fire. It had fallen to a quad three, so it would be nice for Memphis maybe to go make a run yep. in that conference tournament. Uh, but the, Arkansas last year, I'd be interested. I don't think A&M gets in at eight and ten, even if they win a couple in the SEC tournament. I think if you lose Saturday, you got to win the SEC tournament. Yep. With that said, if they were to win Saturday, let's just say let's just say they need to win. Okay, if they do, what do they need to do in Nashville? Logan disagrees with me. I believe if they win, win one, 
lose one, they're probably on the outside looking in. But, but they're being ma- discussed. But they're going to be in the discussion. Yep. They're, th- that would put them at 11 and 9 and on a. That would put them in 11 and 9 and on a four game winning streak, you know, in 11 and 9 and 20 conference games. Um, that would be probably in that game. I don't know. If, it depends on who you're playing, right? It could be a quad two win right. to add to that. And if you lose the next game, you're probably, what, 12 and 11 or 11 and 10 in quad one and two games, which is A, a really high number, and B, that's a, to have a winning record in those games is really strong. Um, if they win two, and this is where he and I really differ, because to me, if they win one, they're going to have a hard time getting in. But they will be in one of the handful of teams that they're arguing over. Right. Right? If they win two, and this is the difference, I think they're going to get in. Logan and maybe you think there's work to do. And I, I, I understand that in. if you win that, that third game, you're probably certainly in. But I'm just saying, if they win this one and win two in Nashville, that second win is going to come almost certainly against Alabama or Kentucky or Tennessee or Auburn, somebody like that, I guess, or South Carolina. I'd like to see a get another crack at yep. them. It's going to come against one of those teams, so it's going to be a quad one, maybe even if it's a Tennessee, another eye-catching victory. But you're going to have to beat somebody good. You're going to have to beat somebody good in the conference. If they do that and maybe get a quad two, they almost certainly would get a quad two in that that second game in the tournament that they win. The only reason I, I, I think they'd be in with those two. If, I do. That'd too. be a five game win streak, right? It'd be a five game win streak with, again, like no worse probably than a quad two in their second tournament game. And then you'd be playing a, uh, actually, I'm, what am I talking about? In their second tournament game, it'd be a quad one win. Quad one. And, but here, my only doubt is what we saw in 22, mm-hmm. right? And that just because they were on a win streak, they beat the teams they were supposed to. And because of that, and, the you know the the place they got last year right the nine seed like the- Richard Zane thinks you know he he's been you know I think you know he he'll quit fairly easily like if he was doing like Elko's workouts Elko Moffitt you know, <laughs> he'd be the guy that just you know like hey just I tap out when they're asking them to squat and hold about forty pounds like this and you're staring at your opponent. And you're you're in a full squat, heels on the ground, holding up the weight for as long as you can, and the the loser is the first person where the weight goes. He's the one that would just, well, I'm not going to win. I'm just going to quit. And so his theory is is the NCAA selection committee beat him into submission two years ago, and and even last year, and he believes that tournament games do not matter. I disagree. I think they do matter. I think sometimes the committee just screws up yeah. and they get it wrong. And I think that when you're on the bubble, getting a game, like we've, I think we've seen, I could give you countless examples of a team that wins a massive game in a conference tournament and it gets them in and another team goes out and that team's crying about right. it. And it's because of what happened in a conference tournament. So it does matter. Doesn't mean they're always going to get it right. But I think, I think if, for the reason they were kept out, uh, why they were so underseeded last year was because that non-conference schedule was so bad. And the reason that they were left out the year before is I do think the committee simply got it wrong. Yeah, I think if this team gets in, it's because they played a, a tremendous non-conference schedule. They tested themselves. They played a tougher one than most teams in college basketball. They won a couple and, of those. And then they and they've got some important wins on their resume. I know they've got some bad losses, but you you I don't think you can get in with a middling record and and bad losses with no really good wins. They've got three really, really good wins right now, three exceptional wins. And if you can get a fourth one in there, I don't think the teams that they're gonna be competing against for a bubble spot are gonna have those caliber of wins on their resume. Yep. Let's hit a break. But you gotta get a fourth. For me to feel like you're in. We'll come back with one final segment here on Texax Radio.
Seven minutes left on the show, Billy. I just let you know. Sometimes we don't know where the thoughts are going, yeah. and we got to rein it in. Uh, a week from today, we'll be getting ready for a little uh, SEC baseball um, for A and M. But yeah. we've got some stuff to take care of beforehand. Uh, big, not big. Well, that but, little wake up call last yeah. night. You know, like you better be ready for Rhode Island. I know they beat who they beat last week in one game. I think they beat Washington State one out of three. I don't think Washington State's a bad. Uh, Pac-12 team this year, and, and so, look, you, you ought to, you certainly ought to win that series. You're obviously going out there thinking you want to sweep. The last couple of years have showed you, though, they, they haven't always blown the door off in these early season mm-hmm. series. You look at Seattle, Portland State. I know, I think they swept Seattle, but that was a tougher go of it, or maybe they went two and one, but Seattle, Portland State, uh, Pan the year before, yep. Lamar early season last year. And look, that not every game they've played in this run has been a cakewalk. Obviously, Texas Southern the other night. Um, USC? They had one. No, I think they – Well, was, it was tough for a while, yeah. For the first but, four but, or five innings, well, yeah. USC, and to me, I'm talking about like these home games when you sure. look at the name of the team, you go, oh, they should win or sweep. Yep. Um, I think the middle game against McNeese was tight. Mm-hmm. Uh, who they, who else did they have? Was it the middle game against UIW as well? Started off tight. Not UIW. No. Uh, oh, well, they, no, no, no. Uh, uh, Wagner. Wagner. Wagner yeah, sorry. The middle game against Wagner. So yeah. there's going to be a game probably this weekend that you know Andem's going to have to fight through. I think they will. I think they'll sweep this team. Um, and I think they'll go into Tuesday with you know one more game left before they go into conference and with a chance to stay undefeated. We'll see. But um, you got Texas. Wait, oh Houston Christian March twenty sixth there. So hey Dawson, put up the tell the tape again if you don't mind because this caught my attention. Look at the team ERA there, Billy. If you can read it for Rhode Island, <laughs> nine eight eight. That ain't good. That ain't good going against this line. No, but but. You know, the weather moving in, it's a little cooler this weekend. Yep. Who knows? You know, hopefully the bats stay hot. They they finish the game hot with those two big home runs late against uh, against TSU. So hopefully that kind of sparked them. Um, I'm, not wor- look, I'm not worried about – I just want to see the team, like, individually. I want to see some more pitching emerge. You had to be really pleased with the pitching uh, on Wednesday night. Yep. It's actually pretty remarkable. The numbers that you saw in the ERA of A&M right there. It's remarkable what they're doing on the mound. And look, I know this isn't, right now, it doesn't look like a World Series, you know, Omaha, Texas Longhorn team. But you're still putting up numbers like that where you're completely shutting down teams like USC, Texas, Arizona State. And then the overmatched teams are completely overmatched. You're not even having, like, a hiccup. So when I mention those close competitive games, Every one of them was because an opposing pitcher or a couple pitchers kind of held the bats in check for a while of that game. It hasn't been because pitching in A&M. You know, the Aggies haven't had to win a single slugfest yet. Right. And, they, and we know they will in SEC play. You can't sustain that level. But, again, I just say compare that to non-conference resumes in previous seasons. Compare that to non-conference resumes around the country. Now, I do think there's a little bit of a gap now between A&M and some others, and that's because this past weekend a lot of teams played in those really brutal, tough tournaments. Yeah. A&M and TCU aren't really at fault for Arizona State and USC not being very good. Um, had it been just the, the timing of it, sure. they'd have been in Houston playing against you know some probably some better competition. But – those numbers are staggering. They're eye-catching, and those numbers tell you this is a really good pitching staff. And I think it's one that's only going to get better. we got two minutes left. Let me do this and one, one more baseball thought. It's time to end the day with Double Dave's color number 12, 979 We'll hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls mm. and a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's. Serving Aggie Lance child. since 1984. A bearded child. Serving pizza and your favorite uh, world-famous uh, pepperoni rolls. Just click on DoubleDave's.com, and your favorites are on their way. Who's Richard Cheese Zane rolls. hitting the glass? Cheese rolls. Hey, um, you like the nickname Prey Prey for Ryan Prager? Can we move on? That's a good nickname. Like Bebe? You know, like Cray Cray, but Prey Prey. He's Prey.
No? Let's go. Uh, yeah, Angry right. Elephant tomorrow? Yep. Should we play games? Should we ask the Q and A? How do you want to do it tomorrow? Let's tell, tell the people. Play game. Yeah, we can play like the uh, buy sell leads. We can do. What do we do today, Cali? What was the name of that game? There's nobody over there. Oh, uh, th there you go. Let's play that game where nobody shows up. <laughs> no, show up to the Angry Elephant. It's been one of those shows, folks. Yeah, it is what it is. We still got a minute and fifteen seconds. So. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's called. Let's figure out a way to close. You know the show. what I want to talk about next week? What's I've got. That? Um, Write this down. Just some team stuff, football wise. Put that on your list because some good, some good intel over there. I've been, I'm pretty excited. They wrapped up their team workouts yesterday. Those things are so competitive. They're, they're I think a lot of the returning, a lot of the newcomers, really have kind of elevated the, like, hey, here. This is how we roll. This now. is how we. This is how we thought it was going to be at A&M. This is how we work. A lot of the guys coming back were like, they weren't used to that. And, and yes, I'm sorry, like that's a damning indictment on the way things were. You've had, heard kids come in here and some of the players yeah. reference that. Hey, it's, not, it's a different ball game now. They've adapted as these, I think as it was eight or ten of these such workouts. They've adapted and, and yesterday extremely competitive. Billy, thank you, sir. We'll see All you at right. the Angry Elephant Magnolia tomorrow. That's going to do it for Tech Sags Radio on a Friday. We'll see you there at the Angry Elephant. We're here on this show on Monday morning.